I'd like to share some background information about myself. I was raised by my mother, who is 50% Cherokee and 50% French. Us kids have never met our biological grandpa and believes in paranormal things, but tries to pretend they aren't there. My father is Scottish, English, German and Jewish by blood. He on the other hand is 100% atheist and is rather skeptical about things he can't explain and endeavors to be a logical and scientific person in all things. Due to major differences in personalities, beliefs and values, they divorced when I was eight. She soon married my stepfather, who was a devout Southern Baptist from Mississippi and basically gave up her identity as a native and became a God fearing woman. Despite issues with my mother, my dad continued to let us visit with her mum and stepdad because he felt they were good people. They taught us many things about native culture, spirituality, legends and the people. My grandmother and I spent a lot of time together, so I was given an opportunity to learn Cherokee medicine. My grandma comes from a long line of medicine women and men, and is one herself. Now, so many years later, at the ripe old age of 23, I am myself one of them. You now have some insight. About two years ago, my father, brother and I moved into a new home, a little more in the country than our previous homes had been something we all thoroughly enjoyed because we grew up immersed in nature and loved the land. Shortly after moving there about three months in, I decided it was time to expand my family by getting myself a puppy. This would be the first dog that would actually be in my care. I've always had a strong connection to dogs, as my guiding spirit is a wolf. And after a while of searching, I came across a beautiful five month old male German Shepherd slash Pitbull mix. I went to meet him and instantly fell in love. He was the greatest, very sweet, kind to the cats and protective of me and became my best friend. Everything you could want in a dog. Now anyone who has owned a puppy or young dog knows that potty training is a task. Even after being with us two months, he still would wake me up every two to four hours to go outside. Hard on the circadian rhythm, but it had to be done. On this occasion in particular, we got a late night visitor we weren't expecting. My dog woke me up in the night, this time around 2.45, and I wasn't ready but dragged myself out of bed, clicked on the leash, opened the back door, and greeted me with a cool breeze. I rolled my eyes and went out into the yard with my pooch. He did his usual dog thing, sniffed around, jumped in the freshly cut grass, completely forgetting what we'd come outside to do in the first place. I whistled at him, recaptured his attention, and he got back to his business. He squatted, and I turned my head to the sky, offering some privacy. The moon was exceptionally large that night, almost full, but not quite. During this observation, I began to realize there was no typical nighttime noise around me. As if this wasn't unusual enough, I had a shiver go down my spine and my arm hairs began to stand on end. That's when I heard my dog let out a low growl as he pinned himself against my legs. When I looked down at his tail, it was tucked and hackles were raised. When I tried to move, he pressed himself against me more. Another shiver came over me. And now I took the opportunity to follow where his eyes were looking. They were looking to what appeared to be a coyote, not totally uncommon in the area. We'd heard of them on many nights living here, but this was different. It looked different and felt different. The most frightening thing, however, was that it was looking right back at me. I didn't move. I didn't take my eyes off it. That's how I was able to see its features so clearly in the moonlight. Its fur looked thin, even bald in some spots. Its eyes were yellow, not reflective yellow like you see on a dog in the dark, but yellow like the sun, very powerful and almost blinding. Then looking more closely, I noticed its back legs were longer than a normal coyote, longer than any canine creature should be actually starting at the hips and going down, they seemed to look almost bipedal in design. That's when it dawned on me just 
what I was seeing. I picked up my 60 pound dog, never taking my eyes off the creature. As I did, I said a Shiroki prayer in my head that I had learned from my grandma. As if it were physically upset, it backed up slightly. And then I heard a voice that perfectly mimicked my grandma say, Why would you do that, Mikas? No one aside from my grandparents ever called me that. It was their special name for me. With that, I darted for the door, dog still in my arms. I put him down and locked the door behind me. The noise must have awoken my brother, because when he came into the kitchen all bothered, he asked me what was going on and why the dog was all riled up. I held my finger to my mouth and shut off the light. We then made our way into the living room, shut that light off as well. And like something out of a horror movie, the outline of a tall humanoid thing shone through the stained glass window on the door, thanks to the bright moonlight. We both froze and he made a grab for the knob when it started to turn, capturing it just in time to lock it. That's when it spoke to him, but this time in my grandpa's voice. Baba, why don't you let grandpa in? They live on the reservation in Cherokee, North Carolina. His face turned ghostly white, and he turned to me. That's when I mouthed the word, and he paled even more. It began to tap on the glass, and we both went into my room and ignored the knocking. The next night around the same time, the tapping grew louder. We sat in the living room, praying to Ulenanuhi, the Cherokee sun goddess, also called the Great Spirit, that it would go away. The tapping turned into knocks, which turned into pounding the more we prayed. This must have awoken my father because he came downstairs in a half. We told him about the night prior during the day, and he didn't believe us and thought it was just one of my brother's friends being an ass. So when he saw the silhouette in the window, he grew even more angry, made a beeline for the door, and we yelled at him not to open it. However, instead of harming him, it seemed to be afraid, because it got down on four legs and disappeared down the road. My dad's face paled as he stumbled back a few steps. He locked the door behind him, and we all went to bed. The next day, we spoke of the situation. I explained to him the natives call this creature a skinwalker. They aren't very common in Cherokee land. They're more of a Western native legend, but my grandparents still taught us about them. Dad being a skeptic, just summed it up to a weird thing he could explain later. Later that day, I went to our local craft store and bought juniper ash as my grandma instructed and sprinkled it around our house. It never returned but my dog was never the same after that night. It's as though the entire experience changed him. He went from a loving animal to mean and unpredictable. He started lashing out to anyone who wasn't female. We tried correcting it over the course of a year and a half, but nothing helped. He finally harmed my brother, causing him to bleed, and I was forced to find him a new home. Luckily, he is with a couple who are both female, and he seems much happier. But even to this day, I guarantee he won't go out at night. I didn't mention the name of the creature many times because it's considered a bad omen in native culture to give these things energy. If anyone is nervous, let me know and I will happily walk you through a prayer ritual my grandma taught me. I hope you enjoyed and pleasant dreams. Let's set the background first. I grew up in a very rural area. My parents have a pretty big piece of land with a nice two story farmhouse in the middle of it. To the south of the house is a peach orchard. The west is where the driveway is. It goes through an alley of cottonwood and pecan trees, but the land is pretty open and was used for cattle farming. The east and north is dense woodland and shrubs, which reaches all the way to our neighbors about two miles. Back then, I was working at a carpenter shop in town. 
I had just gotten my driver's license, and so I was able to get there on my own. It was about an hour and a half drive though. We started fairly late in the day at about 10 a.m. The owner of the company was sort of a night owl and loved to sleep in, but because of that, we had to stay until 9 p.m. That was no problem in the summer, but turned out to be a bit of a nuisance in the winter, as it got dark pretty early. And I hated driving in the dark, because the lights on my car weren't the best anymore. I drove a 1987 Chevy pickup, which had obviously seen better days. I hadn't had much money back then. So this was all I could afford. So one day in late December, about 10 or 11 years ago, I left work much later than usual. I'd made a pretty stupid mistake on a nightstand I was building for a customer and needed to fix it. As the customer was going to pick it up the next day, when I finally finished, it was about midnight. I cussed out my own stupidity, closed the shop up tight and went to my car. There are two routes I can take to get home. One is on a highway, the other one is through the back country and dirt roads surrounded by thick brush and trees. I usually took the highway, as it was much faster and safer, especially in the dark. But this day, there had been an accident, and the highway was blocked by emergency services. So I took the long way home. As soon as I left the main road and made my way up the dirt trails, I got this feeling, you know the one, as if something bad is about to happen, almost like impending doom. The longer I drove on the road, the stronger the feeling got, until it felt like all of my body and soul were aching desperately to turn around, drive back all the way to the roadblock, and wait until it got opened again. I tried to suppress it as best I could, and tried to convince myself that I had driven this route many times, and I knew that it was safe, albeit a bit rough on the truck. When I was driving through an especially rugged piece of brush, only about 10 miles from my parents' farm, all of a sudden, my left front tire popped. I did my best to keep the truck on the road and made it to a safe spot. I kept a spare tire in the toolbox and had changed tires quite a lot on my own. And I knew it would be just a minor inconvenience. And I would be rolling again in a matter of minutes. That's where I was wrong. I climbed up on the truck's bed, only to find that my toolbox had been broken into. And all of my tools and my spare tire had been stolen. So there I was, still miles away from the nearest settlement in bear and wolf country, in the middle of the night with no cell phone, and no way to repair my truck. I always kept a sort of survival kit in my toolbox with a blanket, a small axe, a fire starter kit, and some MREs. But it had been stolen too. Thank God I still had my trusty pucko, which my sister gave me when she moved to Finland. So I made the second but bigger mistake on the day. I decided to walk home. To this day, I still don't know why I made this decision. All I had to do was wait in my truck until sunrise. And I knew a neighbor was driving this road every day at around 8am. He could have taken me to town and called my parents to get the truck. But some stupid fart in my brain said, now nah, we're walking. So I went. I locked the car, took my rucksack with my belongings with me, and began walking. I couldn't have walked far when I got this eerie feeling, like something or somebody is watching me. I turned around, but nothing was there. I picked up my pace to make it out, when all of a sudden I heard some rustling in the bushes to my left. I called out if there's someone there, but of course received no answer. The feeling of being watched got stronger and stronger as the rustling became more frequent, 
when suddenly the brush stopped, and I came to a small clearing. That's when he spoke to me for the first time. Hey there, boy. He had a pretty weird pronunciation. The first part was spoken softly, almost gently. But the boy was like an explosion in my ears. He made a tiny pause in between, and then spewed out boy. He was big, six foot six, wearing a long trench coat and hat. Grey, short hair with lifeless eyes, almost like that of a perished fish. But what really scared me was his dog. He had a huge, black, shepherd-like dog, but it looked very wild, almost like a wolf. I immediately froze with fear. I always heard this term, but could never imagine it being like this. I couldn't move. I just couldn't. I tried, trust me, God, did I try. What you doing there, boy? He asked. Don't you want to talk to me, boy? I still couldn't move a finger, but my mouth slowly started to work again. I told him about the truck, and how I was trying to walk home. But I don't think he was able to understand a word that I was saying, as I was stuttering and slurring the words due to fear. He made few steps towards me, his dog fixated on me like prey. He came so close that I could smell him. A very odd smell. A bit like old cigarettes, but there was something else that I couldn't point out. I still stood there unable to move. He took a deep breath and closed his eyes, almost like he wanted to remember the smell of fear radiating from me. He started to grin. Not a genuine, honest grin, but the one where the eyes aren't involved. They stayed as lifeless as they were. Be careful out here, boy. There's a lot of dangerous things out here, boy. He said, and vanished into the brush as suddenly as he had appeared. I started to thaw up and was able to move my body again. All of a sudden, my knees felt weak and wouldn't bear the weight of my body anymore. I collapsed to the ground and my whole body began to shake uncontrollably, and I began to sob with relief. As soon as I had regained control over my body again, I ran, like I never did before and never have again. All the way home, which was quite a long way. I can't describe the feeling of relief coming over me when I saw the also familiar porch lights coming up in the distance and I reached the edge of the woodlands on our property. Hey there, boy. My heart skipped a beat. I screamed from sheer terror, and knew that this would be the end. So, I didn't stop running. I ran and ran and ran and never even bothered to look back. Only when I reached the warm yellow circles of light, cast by our porch lamps, did I dare look back. He stood there on the edge of the woods, like he did on the clearing, his animal on a leash next to him. He grinned this creepy grin again. I fumbled out my keys, as my parents locked the back door at eight. I unlocked the door and stumbled in. Only when I had locked the door, I started to feel remotely safe again. I went upstairs to my room, and made sure that all the windows were locked on my way up. When I looked out the window, he was gone. I told my dad about this when we got into the truck the next day. He said this was likely Samuel, an old hermit who had a small cottage down there in the woods, who had been living there for at least 30 years, but that he had never seen him with his own eyes. So in retrospect, perhaps I was never in grave danger. Maybe. But nevertheless, to the strange creep in the woods. I'd rather not meet you again. This story took place over the summer. My friend Jonathan 
had the house all to himself for the week and he invites me to spend the weekend with him. Since we were both 15, having the house to ourselves was great. I arrived at his house on Friday night. Jonathan's two younger brothers, Saeed and Ivan, were also there, but we didn't really mind as they stayed out of our way. Around 9.30, Saeed and Ivan wanted to play hide and seek in the dark outside. Jonathan's house is located at the far end of his neighborhood, and behind his house are the woods. We agreed, grabbed flashlights and headed to the woods. Saeed and I continued first while Jonathan and Ivan ran into the woods and hid. After about a minute, we went looking for them. For around five minutes, both of us walked around and shone our flashlights all over the place hoping to find them. We soon reached a small trail that led away from our path, which was odd because I couldn't recall ever seeing it before. We followed it and a minute later appeared on a small clearing and in front of us, maybe 30 yards away, was an odd looking shack. It appeared abandoned, was rather small and the wood was old and charred. The steps leading to the front door were well run down and the windows had shattered glass. Both of us looked unsure as we stared at the shack. Something wasn't right. None of us had ever gone this deep into the woods, let alone at night. But we also thought that this was where Jonathan and Ivan had hidden. We both walked slowly to the shack. I hopped onto the porch and made a loud creaking noise. I heard movement coming from inside. Saeed stayed back and I nodded to him, indicating they must be inside. I went over to one of the broken windows, careful to avoid the glass. I peeked inside the shack, shining my light inside, and screamed in horror when I saw a figure hunched in the far corner. His eyes darted to where I was as the light shone on him. He had a scruffy beard, wide-eyed and wore a heavy brown coat. But what terrified me the most was when his mouth curled into a sinister smile the moment he saw me. I got off the porch and Saeed began to ask what was wrong, but I yelled at him to run. We ran and reached the end of the path and ran back in the direction of Jonathan's house. I saw two pairs of lights in front of us and seconds later we saw Jonathan and Ivan. I frantically explained to them about the shack and what I saw. Both didn't believe me, but before I could explain any more, we heard branches being crushed behind us and heavy footsteps getting closer. We all sprinted away and immediately reached the house. Jonathan quickly unlocked the door and we all bolted in. We stayed silent for a moment before explaining what I had seen. We were all still a bit scared and felt uneasy, especially considering that the footsteps we heard were most likely that same man from the shack. We turned on a movie to try to calm ourselves down, forget what had happened. At 20 past midnight, the movie was ending. We saw one of the lights from the back porch turn on. We had a clear view of the back porch from where we were all sitting. The lights were the ones that turn on when movement is detected. Jonathan and I got up and slowly went towards the back porch screen door to see. We pulled the curtains and gasped when we saw a large figure hopping the fence. I was worried and scared as I thought it was the same man from the shack. We debated on what to do. But I decided that if it was indeed the same man, we had to call the cops as he now knew where we lived. Two officers arrived at Jonathan's house and we explained to them the whole situation about the shack and the man being in the backyard. A separate cop was called and two of them went to search the woods while one cop stayed with us. After half hour, the two officers returned and told us they found the shack but no man. However, they did find meth, a sleeping bag, a candle and a hunting knife. The cop said the man was probably some homeless meth addict who had used the shack as a place to stay. To this day, I still wonder what the man was doing when he entered the backyard and what he would have done if we had all gone to sleep and didn't notice the porch light turn on. Growing up, 
I had a childhood friend that lived relatively close by, and we were like two peas in a pod. We both were adventurous, believed in the paranormal, enjoyed astronomy, and generally just being outside. She was born in Alaska, and her dad had lived there for quite a while. So they were always into camping, hiking, fishing, skiing, you name it. It was with my friend's family that I got introduced to fishing and did a lot of camping. This happened during the mid to late 90s, and we were about 11 years old. One camping trip, we went to this lake in the forest that was surrounded by a meadow, and feeding the lake was a small stream leading out of the woods. We played in the meadow and stream all day, while my friend's dad fished. The lake wasn't very big, and because it had a meadow wall around it, he could keep an eye on our whereabouts while he fished. While messing around by the stream, the wooded area it was coming from gave me weird vibes. I can't explain it. I just felt really uneasy. The day faded away into early evening, and it was time to leave and find a camping spot. My friend's dad packed up his fishing gear, and we all walked back to the truck on this long winding path through the woods. Once in the truck, we drove into a more remote area of the forest and made our way up this steep road that was so rough and at such an incline that I was convinced that my friend's dad was going to break his truck. He had a four, maybe six cylinder Toyota pickup that was about as basic as a truck could get. In fact, I'm not even sure if the truck had four wheel drive being an Alaskan outdoorsman. With years of experience, I trusted him. We finally made it up to the top, which was flat and relatively open with a big area of forest in the opposite direction from the road we drove up. We pitched our tents, got everything set up. Then my friend and I decided to go explore the area. We were maybe 50 yards from the tent when we heard a big crack as a tree branch snapped in the woods behind us. We got quiet and looked in that direction, but did not see anything. Thinking it was just a deer, we brushed it off. As we were walking, we heard it again and whispered to one another about what it could be, but carried on going. It stopped briefly. And when we were about 200 yards from our camp, we sat on a boulder looking down the steep wooded hill overlooking the dirt road from where we had come from. Suddenly, we heard another cracking branch from behind. Whatever it was seemed to be following us. Our imaginations were going wild. We came up with everything from serial killers stalking us in the woods to deer, to Bigfoot. When we got back to the campsite, we told her dad what we had heard and how it seemed to be paralleling us. He kind of played it off as a black bear and secured all the food. Later on, my friend confided in me that my dad had gotten out his pistol and would be sleeping with it that night. My friend and I were sharing one tent and he was in his own tent not too far from us. So we figured that everything will be okay. I awoke sometime in the middle of the night to hearing something or someone walking outside. As I laid still listening, I could hear it quietly circling the tent. It sounded like it was walking on two legs because it had a very distinctive rhythm in how it walked. Whatever it was sounded big as I could hear its weight, as it put each foot down and walked. I could even hear relatively quiet but deep, heavy breathing at times, as I lay there listening. I could hear it wandering to the other parts of the campsite, and then back to our tent, almost as if it were walking in a big repetitive loop. This went on for a long time 
Terrified and unable to wake my friend, I lay there listening, until eventually, I fell back asleep. The next morning, I told my friend and her dad about it, but I didn't know if they believed me or not. Interestingly, absolutely nothing in the camp was disturbed in any way. The ground was not very soft, and in some places was covered in grass, so there were no footprints either. This is something that I have never been able to explain. And to this day, it lingers in the back of my mind when camping. I always wonder what it was that walked around our tent all night. I was born and raised in Charlotte, and still live on the east side. There was a local public park near my parents house called McAlpine Creek which is mainly a large cross country trail stretching miles across East Charlotte. The park is enveloped by hundreds of acres of dense forest and underdeveloped land that is discreetly amidst busy streets and highways. You almost don't realize how big the forest stretches because of the infrastructure around it. There is a myth folklore tales about a devil church or Satan church deep within the park. There are a few videos on YouTube and other forum posts around the web of local attempts to approach it. A simple Google search, and you'll surely find it. In my senior year of high school, scourging the internet about the supposed church, I had somehow found a somewhat vague description of the location from someone who had attempted to go down the roads deep within the park to find it. My girlfriend at the time and I one Friday night, decided to try and find the road that leads to the church. We drove down the winding roads behind a carmax that borders the dense woods of the park, where there is a small neighborhood of sorts. Cautiously driving down these quiet and dark roads, we had found a seemingly abandoned dirt track offshooting from the paved road. Keep in mind, there are almost no streetlights anywhere. While driving for about two to three minutes, there had been a pickup truck in front of us, maybe 50 feet or so away. Upon seeing the dirt track, our interests peaked. We stopped the car to discuss what we wanted to do. We began to slowly pull onto the dirt track. Simultaneously, the pickup truck ahead of us abruptly stopped and sat in place. We noticed this having fully pulled into the dirt road at this point and immediately stopped and stood still frozen in panic. The driver of the truck quickly put his or her car in reverse, and we could see the rear reverse lights on and began to immediately back up towards us. I threw my car in reverse in panic and attempted to turn back the way we had come. I was able to get turned around and back into the driveway fairly quickly. In reverse, the driver of the truck was accelerating very fast towards us, and I floored the gas of my Nissan Altima, and the truck driver followed us for a few seconds and then stopped. We never looked back. We never found the supposed church, but this happening scared the hell out of us, and I've never considered attempting to return. Last summer, my boyfriend and I were camping somewhat remotely in the White Mountains of New Hampshire, presidential range. The sites are well off the beaten path, not a campground, no water or electric, and a tents only. Sites are half a mile to a mile apart, very deeply wooded and isolated. Without a vehicle, you'd have an hour or so to walk to the nearest road. In spite of this, it's still a known area and frequented by campers and hikers, but it's still New Hampshire, so it's already very weird. Over the course of the summer, we made four trips to the same area. The last time was the most remote, with no restrooms. We used the woods. While most people take the general trail, as you can tell where others have been, it really ruins my outdoor pooping experience, so I prefer to find my own new path. In doing so, I wandered a fair distance from our tent site through heavy woods, stopping at the edge of a big thicket of skinny pine trees. 
I could not have felt further away from civilization or people. And crouching down, thought to myself, as much as any of the animals that must be around me, and I couldn't see. It wasn't eerie, but rather hypnotic, just me and nature. I felt anything, or anyone, could be watching me, and I would never know. Right in front of me as I crouched down, I saw something strange. Out of place were two pine trees that had been roughly chopped to about stump size. Their skinny young trees, the types that break easily and can be pushed out of the ground in cold or mushy weather. Each stump was wrapped near the top with gray duct tape and a lot of it. My immediate thought was something was tied up there and then the trees were chopped rather than unwrapping the tape. But why? And what? What could have been held there? This was not the end of the trail. It was really in the middle of nowhere. Someone else would have found it the same way I had. There would not be room for a vehicle, or an ORV, or dirt bike. This was someone in the woods. What tied something up to these two trees using a lot of tape? Suddenly I felt the density of where I was, and that I was within yelling distance of my boyfriend and our tent site, but wasn't alarmed. I could see it wasn't new, but the tape also wasn't faded or worn. I looked around the ground nearby and didn't see anything else with tape or signs that something had possibly been built there. It simply looked like something was tied between two trees with duct tape, and for some reason the trees cut at the top above the wrapping, leaving two stumps somewhat resembling torches in the ground, not burned that's the best way to describe the appearance. It's important to note, this would not have been used for hanging food or meat. If a person had been tied there, it would have been in a sitting position, and the tape was low to the ground, not high. I took my boyfriend back there later to show him, and we both agreed we couldn't come up with an explanation, other than someone tied up something between those trees. But what I wonder, and more importantly, why? We were at our family cabin, deep within the Norwegian woods. There's no running water in the cabin in the winter, as the pipes tend to freeze. We get drinking water from a nearby lake, and water we use for washing and cleaning we get from melting and boiling snow. This started one winter as my father went outside to fill a tin can with snow. As he crouched down by the side of the cabin, removed the lid from the can and filled it with snow. As he turned around to put the lid back on, it was gone. No big deal, he thought. It probably slid or blew away, and since it was dark out, he went back inside without the lid. The next day, we went outside and looked, but never found it, and eventually forgot about it. Life went on, and the next winter, when we were at the cabin once again, we still used the same tin can to collect snow, still without a lid. My dad went outside, filled the can, and as he turned around, he heard a weird sound as he took a step. There it was, on top of the new snow, at the same place he placed it one year ago. He was pale as a ghost when he came back inside. Back in 2008, I was a student planning to go to university, and needed some extracurricular stuff I could put on my entry applications. As most UK students know, one of the best to have on there is the Duke of Edinburgh Award. As part of this award, you have to embark on an orienteering expedition, basically a long trek throughout woodlands and rural villages following nothing but a map and compass. No GPS allowed. It's a teamwork experience, and you camp and overcome hurdles together, etc. I was out of shape at the time, so my uncle volunteered to take me out to the middle of nowhere to get some idea of what orienteering was like. We didn't stay out overnight, which is what I would need to do during the real thing, 
but we hiked 10 miles through woods in a small village in pretty abysmal weather. By the end of the journey, we were soaked to the bone and pretty miserable, looking forward to getting back in the car and heading home. For the last part of the journey, we were on a dirt trail heading uphill with bushes and trees on either side. We were marching onwards in silence at this point. Until all of a sudden, there was a rustling in the foliage to our left. From behind a large bush stepped an old man in a black suit with a red bow tie and dress shoes. He looked to be in his late 70s or perhaps early 80s. Very pale, with liver spots dotting his face and a grey and white comb over to match. I was instantly weirded out. Who dresses like that to go into the woods? The instant thought is that seeing some guy at this age out in the woods in these clothes and in these weather conditions is that this guy has certainly lost his marbles. There was something else that took me an extra moment to notice though that puzzled me. He was bone dry, didn't even have mud on his shoes. We stopped in our tracks and just stared at the man for a moment, who appeared to be as frozen and shocked as seeing us. My uncle made the first move, taking a step towards him, asking if he was all right. The old man continued to stare for a moment, not moving even a twitch, then became suddenly very animated. It was like he suddenly snapped out of a trance. He began flailing his arms wildly, saying something awful had happened and that a good friend of his needed help. He began walking backwards into the woods, motioning for us to follow him, which we did. We started off at a brisk walk then escalated to running as we struggled to keep up with the old man. After a minute, he disappeared ahead of us, but we could hear him and continued following the noise until we reached a huge slope. We stopped at the edge and looked down to see the old man standing at the bottom, motioning us, pleading with us to follow him. I remember looking down at the slope. It was probably a 40 degree angle and spanned for at least 50 feet or more and slick with mud. It looked like an accident waiting to happen, especially given there were no shrubs or roots to hold onto or anything. I remember looking down at the old man on the other side of the slope and wondering how the heck did he cross it so quickly and cleanly. I mean, at that distance, it's hard to see any fine detail clearly at all, but I swear he didn't appear wet or muddy at all. Me and my uncle looked at each other and I saw that he was getting as weirded out as I was. Despite my feelings, I made a step towards the edge and was going to try and make my way down when my uncle grabbed me firmly by the arm and pulled me back. Something's wrong here, he said under his breath. We took a few steps back from the edge, and at this point the old man at the bottom started to get irate. He began pleading with us to come down the slope, telling us he needed our help. His friend was in trouble. My uncle shouted down at the old man that we would head back to our car and call emergency services that professional help would be on its way soon, and they would have all the tools that they needed to help. The old man then got furious and began jumping up and down demanding that we come down the slope right away, or there would be hell to pay. His voice has changed drastically at this point. He was now practically growling his words, his hands bunched up into fists, pounding his knees like an angry toddler throwing a tantrum. I've never seen a grown adult fly into such a rage in my life. His eyes looked like they were on the verge of bursting out their sockets, his skin gone pale to red in almost an instant. We began to hurriedly make our way back the way we came in, his demands and threats getting less audible as we got closer to the trail. Once on the trail, we practically power marched the remaining quarter mile or so to the car all the while my uncle was on the phone to the emergency services, explaining to them that there was a possibly mentally ill man wandering the trail. We were ordered to get into our car and await the police so that we could show them where we had encountered him. About an hour later, we met four officers, two of whom had dogs with them, and a pack of supplies like first aid and emergency blankets. 
We led them to the exact spot and then pointed the two officers with dogs in the direction he led us through the bushes. And the search lasted a weekend, but there was never any trace of the old man. Officers said the only trail they could pick up had been mine and my uncle's. They didn't find any footprints or anything belonging to the old man we encountered. This has been one of my weirdest experiences to date. Any scout that has been to Camp Wanokset has heard the tale of Seiji and Seiji Island. The original tale is about a Native American boy who goes back to his village to skin and properly dispose of the dead animals that the settlers had left and killed. He starts a bonfire in an island, slowly bringing the animals across to burn in his canoe. He gets down to the last three animals, a bear, a deer, and a moose, when the settlers see him and shoot at him. He gets onto the island and jumps into the fire with the animals. Thanks to the fact that he was still alive and holding the animals, their spirits merge together to create what is most commonly referred to as a Wendigo. Every once in a while, he can be seen wandering the woods and streets around the camp. Now onto the story. Being as though it was my third year at Camp Wanok Set, I was very comfortable staying there even at night out in the woods. Both me and my friends Kyle, Will and Ryan are sitting at our table under an awning, telling stories and just having a good time. When Kyle says to be quiet and listen. It was silent for a bit until we heard what sounded like someone running in the woods. We all look over to see antlers poking out from behind a tree. At first, we were pretty worried at the fact that a deer would get this close. But then we realized something. The antlers were three feet above where they should be. Right as we started to back away, it sprinted from behind the trees and slashed at our tents about 10 feet behind us and broke some other things. After about a minute of it breaking things and us getting on top of our picnic table and grabbing our knives, it ran off. For some reason, only a few other people noticed it. Our scout masters came running over to ask if we were okay and what happened, seeing as though we were almost crying and pretty shocked. After that encounter, I will never go back to that camp again. Whenever I think of that camp, I get the eerie feeling that I am being watched. I was 16 at the time, and at a small hunting camp near the eastern panhandle of West Virginia. The camp has a fairly large pond when you drive in. The camp itself is in one large circle with a couple of branching roads. When you come in, you can go straight and sit up by some old growth pine with nothing growing at the bottom and nestled in is a little shack. To the left will take you by the pond and you can continue onto the road and circle up to the mountain where it links with the other road. I have a place on this side about two and a half miles from the pond. At about 10 p.m. one night, I decided I wanted to go camp fishing. So I loaded up my four wheeler with tackle, a road mining hat with a light and a hatchet for any snakes and drove down to the pond on the rocky dirt road. I get down there at about 1030 and my first line is out. When I'm at the wooded area to my right, that's as thick as blackberry bushes with a path cut through to another fishing spot. The road to my left and back down is a little dip. I fish for about an hour and a half, only catching one small fish when I felt eyes on me and heard a branch snap. Now I've been in the woods my whole life at this point, so I grab my hatchet and set it in my lap and keep an eye in the woods what little bit I could with how thick it was, thinking it was at worst a coyote or black bear. 
About thirty uneasy minutes pass, never really feeling the eyes leave me. Then suddenly the air was thinned and everything felt normal. About ten more minutes pass, and I hear a loud skittering and then a thud coming from the direction of the old pine grove. Thinking one of the drunks out there had gotten out and fell, I got up and make my way over to the bank, past the little shed into the old grove. Scanning back and forth with my light mounted to the hard hat, when it happened, in the very edge of the light was a pale humanoid figure on all fours. Its eyes darted to mine. We locked eyes. It being in the edge of the light, I didn't get a good look, but I froze in complete terror, knowing that if I turned my back to it and run, it might react like a cougar, and pounce. I readied the hatchet to defend myself and took a step back. It took one equal in distance to mine towards me. This continued down the bank. It stopping at the top to gaze down at me, without taking my eyes off it or turning my back to it. I turned on the four wheeler, angled the lights to it, and after I do that, I packed my stuff, not turning my back, and hopped on. I floor the four wheeler at it, making it back up and tore down the road to the left, hitting thirty to forty down the road I normally take at fifteen. I look over my shoulder and see this thing running on all fours beside me. This went on for about half a mile until it stopped, crawled into the middle of the road and watched me drive off. I get to camp as fast as I possibly can, load up my weapon. In the corner of my room, and don't dare sleep that night. The moral of the story: don't turn your back and run from the unknown, unless they come at you first, and never go catfishing alone. This particular event happened to me when I was around ten or eleven years old. But I have been visiting my grandma's cabin in Big Bear Lake several times a year since I was a child. This isn't the first strange event to happen to me there, but it is definitely the most memorable. A little backstory: My grandma's cabin sits at the end of a cul-de-sac, right at the edge of a vast, mostly unpopulated stretch of forest. No matter what I do or how I'm feeling, I always have a very strong sensation that I'm being watched when I'm in many of the rooms in the cabin alone, day or night. I've seen shadow creatures many times in the cabin. Have heard strange knocking, whispers, and just generally feel like there is something else living there with us. My grandma has told me of similar experiences and has warned me before that if I ever get a strange feeling when I'm walking in the forest to go home immediately, but she never elaborated. Anyway, me and my dad and uncle. We're walking on a trail that we've been on hundreds of times before. When we reached the first peak of hill that we usually like to stop and look out at the view from, my dad and uncle wanted to keep hiking for a bit, but I decided to go back to the cabin on my own, as it was only five to ten minutes away. I head down the usual path that I go on, not too thinking much about it. When I realize I have no idea where I am. Everything looked the same as usual, but something was wrong. The normal path was different in a way I can't really explain. It seemed to be ten times as long as usual. Everything was silent, and there was absolutely no wildlife about, not even a squirrel. I kept having all of these morbid thoughts coming into my head about how I was lost forever, or some sort of creature was going to swoop me up. Every ten or so minutes. I ended up at a part of the trail that I definitely recognized, only to be in a completely alien area moments later. The path kept winding and winding downhill, and the sun was setting pretty rapidly. I had to have been walking in the direction of the cabin for more than an hour because I remember I kept checking my watch and panicking. At this point, I just accepted that I was lost. I finally made it down to the street and was relieved to be able to orient myself. But I was only one street away from the cabin, although I should have been much further away. 
I was expecting my father and uncle to be home by now, and for my parents to be worried about me being gone for so long. But instead, my mother asked me why I was home so soon. I asked my dad how long they were out there, but they said that they'd only walked maybe 15 minutes longer from when I left them. I don't know if I'm just reading too much into this, and if I were a kid with different perceptions, but something definitely felt very off about that entire ordeal. The details I have on this story are very vague, but someone told me about a teenager who went into the Akala National Forest to hike, and then was reported missing several days later when he didn't return home. A couple of months later, he was found in the woods, and he was like a different person. He appeared to be either drunk or under the influence, but when he was tested, everything came back negative. Mentally, he wasn't all there, but physically wasn't showing any signs of being exposed to anything which would cause this. He kept telling people that he encountered something very strange. It was several months before he was himself again, and he had very little memory of what had happened all those days. I've asked people that I know who live in Akala, or have camped and hiked in the Akala National Forest, and they'd never heard of this story. I really didn't know if this person who told me this story knew if it was true or not. Sounds like it might be true and strange, and weird things have happened in state and national parks. But I do know that over the years, people have gone into the Akala National Forest and never come out. Some of them were harmed or killed by animals. Others had their lives ended abruptly by other humans. And some just vanished without a trace. I've driven through the forest on State Highway 40. And at night, it's creepy. Even in the day, at times. I was 12 or so at the time. Some friends of mine were in Girl Scouts and invited me to join them for a sleepover at this old tuberculosis sanitarium in Marin, just north of San Francisco. At the time, 50 years ago now, the building was not in the best of conditions. There was an old caretaker's cabin and some outbuildings. My friend and I wandered about that first day there. Saturday and, well, we weren't the best behaved little monsters. In spite of the locked doors, we crawled through a window into the caretaker's cabin and explored in there. My friend went upstairs and I stayed down as a sentry. Already nervous, I was even more jumpy when I heard someone coming up the stairs, but it wasn't my girlfriend. There was no one there, at least visibly. Fast forward to that evening. In an attempt to go to sleep, we were overtaken by giggles. Hey, we were little girls. One of the counselors separated us so the other girls could sleep. I was placed in a bed in this sunroom. It was an enclosed room, but with windows on three walls. The wall I was facing when I woke up had a set of French doors and a balcony. Early, before anyone else was awake, I watched a woman with an old fashioned dress and parasol walk across that balcony and descend down the stairs. I just figured it was one of the counselors, rolled over and went back to sleep. Later in the morning, after getting up and dressed, my friends and I explored that balcony, and there were no stairs. Strange. We explored the wooded acreage all around the old sanitarium, and off we went back home. It was only a few years ago I decided to do some research, and learnt that many have seen the apparitions at the facility, so I wasn't just imagining things. In the late spring of 2014, I made the long and scenic trek from Kansas to Arizona. It was in early May, after packing up an apartment full of way more than enough stuff for two people, we removed ourselves from the flatlands and wheat fields of eastern Kansas to the high desert of Arizona. After everything was packed into the box truck, and the car was secured onto the pull-behind car dolly, 
I started the 1500 plus mile trip for the first time. I had never been further west than Colorado prior to that particular trip, as I was born and raised between the Midwest and the eastern side of the United States. Little did I know, I would make the drive again a year later, to collect the belongings we left behind at the cabin when we'd abandon it. I'll never forget driving through Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. There is just something about that part of the country, that specific region, that just is flat out magical to me. And apparently I'm not the only one who feels this way. If you've never been, I suggest you do if you ever get the chance. The first evening that I arrived in Arizona, the sun had already gone down as I made my way off the main highway about 40 miles from the Grand Canyon, and picked my way through the well-worn dirt roads that led out across the desert and towards the cabin that I would be renting for the next several months. I didn't know much about the cabin before my arrival, other than it was supposed to be entirely self-sufficient, with a 500 gallon water tank and four full-sized solar panels, including areas for gardening, walking trails, RV pads, and that the nearest town was located several miles away. In addition, the world's largest stretch of Ponderosa Pine Forest, 1.8 million acres, was situated just 10 miles from the cabin, in the Coconino National Forest. This particular national forest was something I had been very much looking forward to get into explore. It was in this area of the expanse of Ponderosa Pine Forest that I first saw a wild wapiti, Native American for elk. In actuality, there were three of them, each one massive, and was standing shoulder to shoulder, as if posing for a photo. Likewise, each one had an enormous rack. They were easily four feet tall with more points that I could count. I had never seen a wild elk before, let alone three large and picturesque bulls like this. I wish I had been able to take a picture of that magnificent view. I saw several more while I was in the area over the course of the next few months. However, I never did see any more that was so large or with such tall racks as those three bull wapitis from the first night. Being somewhat of a mystic, I instantly took it as an extremely excellent sign to see such impressive stags so close to the cabin, as if they were waiting to greet me, just standing outside of the tree line on the edge of the road, in some strange way, I honestly felt like they wanted to say hello. The cabin itself was everything that I expected and needed at the time. It had a built-in garage, a full loft bedroom, living room, working bathroom with solar shower and flush toilet, a kitchen sink, stove, and a lovely workshop located in the garage. In other words, once I gathered up some necessary supplies from the nearest town, I wouldn't need to interact with anyone on a day-to-day -day basis for long periods of time. And honestly, that was the plan to begin with. The first week or so was spent exploring the general area, including several trips to Williams and Flagstaff, Williams being the nearest town, as well as hiking around through various areas of the Arizona high desert. There were little in the way of trees, other than the above mentioned Ponderosa Pine Forest, as well as scatterings of junipers, which where I come from, seem more like large bushes than actual trees. I hiked in the Coconino National Forest a few times, and I enjoyed it very much. However, I didn't get to spend as much time there as I had hoped to. That said, the area directly around the cabin all 15 acres of the property as well as the hundreds of surrounding acres, were far more interesting than I had anticipated. Once I became familiar with the acreage, I went to work for three solid days building a sanctuary in the middle of the property. During my day hikes around the cabin, I found a perfect outcropping of juniper trees, which appeared to be an old solid clump. 
But upon further exploration, I discovered one could be entered into this particular grove of trees. Inside there was a much more considerable amount of hidden space than it appeared from the outside. To me, it was perfect. This hidden corpse of junipers was the space that I decided to build my stone altar on. Furthermore, I paved a path of sand and stone from the entrance of the hidden grove up to the altar, and eventually beyond. I inlaid the central space with a full moon and crescent moons, using the red rocks found easily in the nearby desert. Beyond this sacred spot, reserved for the altar, I extended the stone pathway to a full circle that I created for meditation and metaphysical workings. I raked and smoothed the working circle, the center of the circle rather, cleaning it of all debris and broken stone until it was the same consistency of a child's sandbox. Next, I gathered four gigantic stones from the surrounding desert, one stone from all four of the cardinal directions, and I placed the large bulky stones according as capstones to my working circle. Once the circle was complete, I extended the red rock inlay of my sanctuary floor, from where it ended slightly beyond the altar, all the way to the working circle in between the circle with the altar and the working circle. I inlaid another full moon with two crescent moons, the sign of the triple goddess into the walkway. Each morning when I would meditate facing the east, sitting in the middle of my circle, as the sun rose over the desert, when I could feel the warmth of the sun begin to warm my inner eye, only then was my morning meditation ritual complete. I repeated these meditations throughout the day by meditating in the correlating directions of the sun at noon and again directly before sunset as well. In all honesty, I would have to say that I've never been so in tune with myself. That said, I constantly had the feeling of eyes upon me. I cannot tell you how many times I stopped hiking and spun around expecting to see some person, predator, or something darting behind a juniper or cactus. I never did catch a glimpse of whatever it was, but I do have a feeling that I know why. It is a strange thing to try and convey to something else. I suppose those feelings are similar to those of a hunter who spent years hunting and tracking prey. After a while, they were able to develop a sixth sense and able to feel when something is watching them. That's how I felt. I've heard Native Americans describe the same feeling before. I know it's cliche that you have the feeling that someone's watching you. That's the sort of thing I'm talking about, but just much stronger and it never went away. Some Native Americans proclaim it to be a thin veil between the worlds, and that the ancients inhabiting the other side can see through it, but that most people are very much unaware of its existence. I'm sure that many of the strange occurrences that I experienced during my time at the cabin had a lot to do with this bizarre feeling of being watched continuously without break. Spending three days of building my sacred space was an experience that I will always remember and cherish. Actively using the area is another experience that I will never forget. That said, many strange things happened there. One day I was hiking through the adjacent desert hills surrounding the cabin. I ventured further away from the property by at least a couple of miles further than usual, and I came across a massive skull of what I could only assume was a longhorn deer. However, it immediately reminded me of the great white buffalo that is sacred to so many Native American nations. The skull was enormous and had two large horns coming out of it, as well as being completely covered in thick snow and white fur. I carried the skull home and properly, after consecrating and blessing it, placed it on my stone altar, where it became the centerpiece until I left for good. I don't know what became of that sacred space, but it sure meant a lot to me. I was heading north and east of the cabin and was staying in just outside of Flagstaff and Williams. 
almost precisely the moment that I turned onto a particular highway. A stream of shadowy winged figures began swooping back and forth over the top of my car. Please try to imagine a long and lonely stretch of road through the heart of the four corner regions where there is little water, hardly any trees at all, and is otherwise very uninhabitable. There are no other cars on the road for miles and miles. I don't recall passing even a single car on that particular stretch of road that night also, though I had to traverse it for several hours. As soon as I turned onto this particular road, a large shadowy figure started swooping around back and forth over my car. At first I thought it was a bat of some kind or a nocturnal bird, but I wasn't aware as much. I was still new to the southwestern region of the United States at the time. I really didn't think much about it, and just kept driving. However, about five minutes into the occurrence, it seemed as if more and more of these things started streaming into the air above my car. Whatever they were, they were keeping up with the speed of my vehicle. So I accelerated. I was taking the car over 100 miles per hour, and to my complete horror, the dark winged figures were still keeping up with my vehicle, like it was no problem at all. Perhaps 10 minutes into this bizarre situation, I was flying down the road at a speed of nearly 120, and eventually decided to slow the car down to the creeping speed of 15 miles per hour. I was barely moving at this point, but nothing changed. Not knowing what exactly to think or expect, I merely resumed the speed limit, maybe five to 10 miles above it for the remainder of this road. And the winged things continued to follow me. I would assume that this experience occurred through only at least 30 miles. However, it could probably be a bit more. After that terrifying experience, I finally came across an eatery made a pit stop to take a bite, and noticed that over the road, there was a Navajo museum. This caught my attention. I finished my food excitedly and got out to explore the Navajo collection. The entire thing was dedicated to the Navajo people, as those lands even now belong to their nation. The whole area was a Navajo reservation, and even the encounter I described earlier, with the winged shadows flying over the top of my car for miles, occurred on Navajo land. The museum wouldn't amount to much for the average person, I'm sure. I highly doubt that it received much attention. I myself spent the better half of an hour going through the handful of exhibits and reading each plaque with detail. Each display was filled with basic things, tools, mock dwellings, and other artifacts. All in all, the place explained a great deal about the Navajo people, and how they'd managed to survive in such a harsh landscape. After I finished walking through the place and checked it all out, I ran across a hitchhiker. It was not only the first hitchhiker I'd seen on the trip, it was in fact the first person or vehicle I'd seen in hours aside from the pit stop. I started slowing down as soon as I passed him, I noticed how heavy his gear was, and also took note of how he appeared to be Native American. Pulling over to the side of the road, my car came to a stop 50 yards or so ahead of the man. I watched him through my rear view mirror as he hunkered down and began running when he'd realized that I was stopping for him. I asked if he needed a ride, to which he replied in the affirmative, and told me he was going in the same direction I was, and that he just needed a lift for the first 30 miles or so. I jumped out, threw his stuff in the trunk, and then jumped back into the driver's seat and took off with my new passenger. Over the next half hour, we shared some lovely conversations. I found out he was full-blooded Navajo, and went by the Christian name Raymond. He was well known in the area, or so he claimed, and that he had lived there for his entire life. When we approached Flagstaff, he asked to be dropped off near an underpass as I was heading further south 
and he needed to go west towards Arizona slash California. I pulled off the major highway that Raymond and I had been traveling on for several miles, then let him out underneath the off ramp he indicated for me to pull over at. Thumbling down cars near underpasses and overpasses where two interstates connect is quite reasonable for hitchhikers as they have an easier time catching a ride along these stretches of highway and interstates than anywhere else. I offered him a brand new tent and some other gear that I just happened to have in the back of my car as an avid hiker, and I had purchased some extra equipment. You see, Raymond had explained to me how his previous gear had recently been ruined due to certain circumstances. So after a tiny bit of coaxing, he graciously accepted. What happened next was one of the strangest things. By the time I left Raymond with his gear and doubled back around onto the highway, heading south, I had a clear view of where I had just left him, and he was nowhere to be seen. There is no way possible that in this short amount of time, Raymond and all the gear that just left the vehicle had vanished. He couldn't have walked off very far in any direction, and it was fairly visible everywhere. I feel that it's important to take a moment to mention that during our conversation, because of my genuine liking for this man, as well as recognizing the hardship he was currently facing in life, I offered him an open invitation to come and stay on the property that I was wanting any time that he made his way out. There was a second cabin, albeit much smaller, which had previously been occupied by a Navajo. He'd been a friend of the woman who owned the land, and quite frankly, he was also a man that I rather enjoyed having a conversation with the few times that I had the pleasure. However, I find it critical to mention this open invitation was for a reason. And the reason is that I gave Raymond the exact location of the cabin, as well as directions as to how to get there from the nearest town, Williams, Arizona. Having grown up in the region, and being 50 something years old, I'm sure it wouldn't take him long to find his way there. That same night, extraordinarily upsetting things began to take place in the cabin. For the first time since being there, which at this point had been several weeks, I heard coyotes for the first time. Previously, I had heard them far off in the distance, but never near the actual property. I hadn't found their tracks around the place either. I thought it was a bit strange that they didn't seem to be cutting through the property, as it was several acres wide, being 15 acres, and I could clearly hear them near the surrounding properties, which were much more extensive. There were plenty of rabbits and small game near the cabin. I kicked them up daily when I walked around the place. However, at the time, I had much bigger issues to worry about than why coyotes weren't bothering me. The night after I returned from my trip, I slept well, lots of things on my mind. And the next morning, of course, I notice the coyote tracks around the cabin. I didn't think very much of it as I had obviously heard them and knew that they had been there. However, the next morning was a different story altogether. That night, the coyotes returned to run circles around the house for what seemed to be half the night. Almost no sooner had my head hit the pillow did I hear the footsteps of what sounded like a rather large pack running around it. Not long after, I began to hear their heavy footfalls pounding through hard packed earth around the cabin. They continued yipping and yapping for some time. That's right around the time, I was once again reaching the rationalization that maybe they had driven another poor old little rabbit into the area, despite the fact I didn't find any fur nor blood, or indicators that they had actually found one or eaten it. This is when I hear a clear and distinct sound, claws on the door. The way that this particular cabin is set up, or was at the time at least, the entire upstairs floor stretched the length of the cabin, and was set up as the only bedroom in the place. I had set up my bed in a particular area, which was located on top of the garage, and the headboard was directly above the wooden side door of the cabin, which led into the garage. This was also the main entrance to the cabin, as the other two entrances were an automatic garage door, which made no sense to open on a daily basis to get in or out of the cabin, and a set of double glass sliding doors 
on the side of the living one, which also wouldn't make much sense to be opening and closing numerous times a day. So the little wooden door on the side of our cabin was our maintenance entrance. And that is the door that I heard the claws scratching. You can only describe terror and shock in so many ways. With so many words, none of which accurately do it justice whatsoever. What I felt lying in my bed and hearing something run around the cabin, scratching on the doors as if trying to get in. I could not convey to you in words if I use 10,000 to do so. Paralyzing fear. That must be the closest. That said, it doesn't bother me to admit the terror that gripped my entire being as I heard something steadily scratch on the door. I began to wonder how it could actually withstand something trying to break through. It wasn't a very expensive door. It didn't consist of solid oak or anything like that. In fact, I believe it was probably made more like particle board with a thin layer of real wood on either side. So I knew it wouldn't take long for the door to give way and allow whatever was outside to get in. I often wonder why I didn't get up, go down and open the door to see what was out there. And then I quickly remember the unnatural terror I felt at the time, and remembered that what I did do was lay there paralyzed with fear until I fell asleep, only to wake up and realize it was already next morning, with the sunshine shining through. My morning ritual at the time consisted mainly of meditating in my outdoor sanctuary, and the returning to the cabin shortly after sunrise to prepare coffee and then relax outside near a large raised bedstone circle garden, where I would then feed the three ravens, Edgar, Alan and Poe, the latter of which would behave somewhat like pets returning daily, day after day for the table of scraps we left them, like offerings inside the stone circle. Sipping coffee, Chills ran through my body as I suddenly recalled what happened the night before, and what had occurred the previous night as well. When I couldn't take it anymore, I went from my chair to look around the cabin, only to find what appeared to be the tracks of an entire pack of coyotes. Tracks upon tracks. But amongst these, several more massive tracks could be seen. They were obviously disturbed by the smaller ones, which greatly outnumbered the larger ones. This little fact left with me even more questions, as I knew full well that no wild dog or wolf is going to accept it and run into a pack of wild coyotes. Keep in mind that it is nothing for a pack of coyotes in this particular region of the country to number well in the dozens. The tracks, the massive ones, piqued my curiosity and left me scared because it was only then that I remembered the scratching sound. I ran to the door, remembering the eerie noise, and stepped in front of the simple wooden door. I felt my heart beat against my chest. There were several sets of long and deep scratch marks that stretched from about the middle of the door and ran several feet up the door almost to a stop. I really had to fight with myself to remain calm and not freak out. You see, as a long-time independent researcher of folklore and mythology, and indigenous culture from all over the world, including the oral lore of Native Americans, I had the sinking suspicion of what may be responsible for the marks, but couldn't bear myself to admit it at the time. Perhaps one of the most mysterious aspects about these incidences that took place over the course of the few days was not just the tracks, let alone the deep gorging scratches on the door, but the fact that for me, to clearly see so many tracks around the cabin, I could not for the life of me find the source of where they came from. It's as if they only appeared out of thin air outside the cabin, ran circles and then vanished again from whence they came. To claim that I understood what happened on the property would be a bald-faced lie. To say that I've come to my own conclusions, these several years later based on countless hours of research, before and after the events described, I would very much believe that I was in the presence of a real-life skimwalker. Native American legends say that these creatures are actually thought to be humans twisted by greed and dark magic, and are not creatures at all. 
and have been known by local Native Americans to frequent the area for centuries. In fact, the skinwalkers are better known amongst members of the Navajo Nation more than any other in the country. Many people don't believe that they exist anywhere else in the world outside of this particular region, as they are thought to be Native Americans who's lost their way and given into dark powers. What I will say, however, is that I still deeply believe deep down that Raymond and possibly some of his friends had paid me a visit and would yet pay me another. On the third night after I'd picked up Raymond, the yipping and yapping coyotes, as well as the pitter patter of their claws circling the cabin, found its way to my ears once more. At that point, I was beyond trying to understand what was happening, and even further beyond trying to confirm it. I had no way of proving anything, and no intention of trying to do so. I have convinced myself, in my heart, that what I experienced out there for three nights in a row was none other than a Navajo skinwalker maybe possibly more in its own territory. As far as what you decide to believe, that's entirely up to you. After the events of those nights, it wouldn't be for a few more short weeks before I lost my nerve and left the cabin for good due to other circumstances, somewhat similar, but yet worlds apart. For my own safety, I left Arizona and never returned, save one time during many months later with several other people to gather up my belongings. To this day, I wouldn't step one foot back onto that particular piece of property, especially at night, even if you paid me. A few years ago, my boyfriend worked in a warehouse that was out in the middle of nowhere, in between railroad tracks and the river. On one side of the warehouse, there was dense forest. He had gotten done at work around 8 p.m., right as the sun was setting. He was sitting outside waiting for his ride and talking to me on the phone. The conversation was normal until I heard his tone change. My boyfriend doesn't want to show much emotion at all, but I could instantly tell something was wrong. I asked what was going on, and he explained that he thought he heard a baby crying from inside the woods. Now I probably would have second guessed and thought he was joking around because that's his personality but the way he was talking, I could tell he was serious. The cries went on for a while, and he said that they eventually turned into whales, and it didn't sound like it was too far. He disconnected our call much to my dismay, and sent me an audio recording of what he was hearing. Sure as hell, it was the sound of a baby. He told me he was tempted to go into the woods and try to find the source of the sound, and I begged him not to. Something didn't feel right. Thankfully, his ride came to get him before he could step into the forest. I've heard these kind of stories before, and many say that it's something or someone in the forest trying to lure people with the sounds of a baby crying. But I can't wrap my head around it. It honestly gives me chills when I think about it to this day. Even my boyfriend doesn't talk about it much, because it genuinely freaked him out. I guess I'm just curious to see what you all make of it. It began in summer of 2013, when I got a divorce and had to move out of my home in the suburbs of Southern California. I met someone, my current husband, pretty soon after the divorce, and things moved quickly, as he asked me to move in with him and I accepted. He had just brought his dream cabin on a local mountain range, with an inheritance he received. We are in Southern California, and the mountain and lake a popular tourist destinations. At the time, I was struggling a lot. I had to quit my teaching job due to severe stress and had lost a substantial amount of weight and was barely weighing 100 pounds. Looking back, I was probably an easy target due to my vulnerable state. We moved that winter just in time for me to vacate my previous home that I had once shared with my ex. It had just stormed and there was ice and snow on the ground. The new house was really dark and just felt sad to me, especially on cold, snowy days. But it was a beautiful cabin that was on a long, private dirt road in the woods. The house was a larger chalet-style home, with dark wooden beams, bricks, 
and wood walls within big old wood burning stove. Shortly after moving in, we found out that the lady that previously owned it was hit by a drunk driver and had to move into a care facility for the severely impaired, which kind of creeped us out a bit. I immediately realized I didn't quite like living in the mountains. The people in the town, especially our handful of neighbors, were really strange, paranoid and rough. There was just a negative energy there, especially in certain parts of the mountain. I was so in love with my then boyfriend though, that I wanted to make him happy and knew how much he loved it there. So I didn't say anything at first. The first time I noticed the negative energy was about a week after we moved in. We went for a hike towards early evening. We wanted to explore the miles of wilderness behind our home and were excited. As we walked further along, we saw old abandoned ranches and log cabins. There was even one area that had some evidence of witchcraft. There were many local legends of a satanic cult that referred to themselves as goat men. As we walked into a thickly wooded area, all the hair on my body suddenly stood up, and I noticed an electric charge in the atmosphere, along with the sizable deafening silence. I tried to ignore this creepy feeling and kept walking. A few minutes later, my husband stopped in front of me and said he had just realized we weren't on the trail anymore. We looked back and sure enough, there was no trail in sight. The sun was now setting and the scenery was disorienting. After about an hour of trying to find our way home, I started to cry. It felt like we were going in circles and I was sure we would end up as missing people, but fortunately found a trail that led us back home. I think it was this day that something from the land attached itself to me. Soon after the incident in the woods, I started to feel oppressed by something very dark. I started doing things that was really out of character for me, like binge drinking and picking fights. I would almost go into a trance and from what my husband tells me, I'd run out into the forest and disappear for hours during fights, even late at night. I'd have no recollection of this. I only remember standing in front of our house late at night with cut up bare feet and being confused and disoriented. My husband would be upset and tell me he had been frantically looking for me for hours, but it never seemed to me as if any time had passed. I got a job working at a local church camp. I'm not super religious, but jobs up there are scarce. And I noticed that the only time I felt normal was while I was at work. I felt like I was having some kind of internal battle between good and evil. While I spiraled down at home, I got diagnosed with a severe illness that no doctor could really explain, was constantly in the hospital and put on heavy narcotics, which only aggravated my spiral downwards. We seemed to be having really bad luck too. For instance, one time my husband was driving in a really remote part of the mountain when his car broke down. So I jumped in my car to go fetch him when suddenly my car blew a gasket clean through the hood, which no mechanic had ever seen or could explain. I had to hitchhike to where my husband was and we had to tow both cars. My husband's car mechanically had nothing wrong with it at all. And it worked just fine after we towed it. Yet it would always break down periodically and always in a remote part of town with no cell service as we lived way off the beaten path deep in the woods something always seemed to go wrong. Just before things could go wrong, I'd get that creepy feeling with my hair, where it stood on end, and the feeling of electricity in the atmosphere. As things progressed one day after drinking and taking pills, I remember feeling pulled out into the forest. I went stumbling through the woods sobbing and having an overwhelming urge to end myself. I kept thinking that this was the only way out. This was a common thing I started doing. And it was as if I was only in some kind of trance. I remember constantly feeling paralyzed with fear, sorrow and despair. I began to feel like my true self was gone and I couldn't get to her. I began to feel numb, regardless of how much I was unraveling at home. 
I still functioned at work and even managed to get a few promotions. I felt like I had two personalities. Around this time, weird things started happening in the house. It would start with electrical feelings, goosebumps, and then bam, all the lights and ceiling fans would turn on full blast on their own. I'd come home from work and think someone was in our house because all the lights would be on. One time I was sleeping and I could hear the remote control button for fan speed clicking on, and then all the lights turned on as well as the fans. I would get out of bed and yell, stop it, and hide the remotes for the fans and TVs. But it started taunting me. It would turn on all the electronics late at night. If I lay down for a nap, or any time I was laying in a room, feeling depressed, it was like it knew that that would push me over the edge. Around this time, we felt an oppressive presence, like it was watching us sleep. It was only then that what had been causing these problems revealed itself to me. There was a small wooden door in our bedroom that led to the attic, and one night I had a nightmare that felt incredibly real, of watching myself sleep from a different angle in the room, when a pure black demon, with tight black shiny skin, red eyes and a goat looking head and giant horns came out the door and was crouching down watching me sleep by my bedside while breathing what looked like smoke around my body. As it stood up and reached for me with its long pointy fingers, I suddenly woke up choking in a panic. I looked over and the attic door was open. Now that door was extremely hard to open and you had to really tug at it due to it not fitting quite right and running against the door frame. We always left it shut because it was cold, creepy and drafty up there. Terrifying. After that, I dreaded going to sleep and would often stay up all night drinking and descending into madness. No matter where I was, I always had the sensation of being watched, but I was too afraid to sleep, especially in our room. When all the electronics would turn on, when I'd get goosebumps, I knew the demon was near. It really scared me that I couldn't see it, but I knew what it looked like, and I could feel its presence. Things at work eventually got weird too, and I could barely function. I felt like I was hanging on by a thread. I was an emotional wreck, and in heavy counseling, heavy drinking and pill popping, my relationship was on the rocks and I had become a regular at the bar and liquor stores. I was completely out of control and was beginning to get evil intrusive thoughts. One night, I was in a rage and picked a fight with my husband. I don't remember it, but the next day when I was begging him for forgiveness, after he threatened to leave, he told me I didn't even look like myself, that my eyes and face looked dark and evil the previous night when we argued. Then he told me I had shoved and hit him, and my heart shattered to a million pieces. I'm not an angry or violent person at all normally. That broke me. I couldn't stop acting that way though, no matter how hard I tried. I hated myself. One night I got a friend from my hometown who also happens to have abilities. She told me, the land there was bad, and that she wouldn't go up to visit me, and that I should consider moving home. She had a friend that also had moved up there after a divorce and experienced a similar oppression, and fled home in the middle of the night taking only her animals. She'd seen something that she refuses to talk about. It clicked right then. Whatever was up there was evil and affecting me deeply. I broke down and begged my husband to leave. He's the type to do anything for me. So we both started job hunting in the town we wanted to move to, and he listed the house for sale. The second I got hired, I threw some clothes and my dog in the car and never looked back. Luckily, our home sold pretty quickly because we priced it to sell ASAP. The dread lifted slowly, and I made my way down the mountain and back into the city and I felt like I could breathe. I remember thinking how dark it always felt up there with all the trees. It felt suffocating. 
Within a month of moving away, I started to feel back to normal. At first, there was still some activity like the demonic dreams, and one time being awoken by something that felt like a pillow hitting me with a crazy force across the face. But after I had a cleansing done by a Ricky master, it mostly stopped, and I completely lost any desire to drink and switched medications to a non-narcotic. I've never been a drinker, and to this day I have, on average, one or two beers a year. My personality went back to my happy, loving self. The dark thoughts seemed like a bizarre memory. My marriage is solid, and we are like any boring couple. After months of moving, we did receive a call from the couple who purchased our home, asking if we ever noticed any weird or demonic activity in the home. They kind of just made it a joke. Ha, ah, never mind, we'll stick to our plan to get an exorcism done. I felt like there really was no point in telling them, as it was never the home, it was the land. It was like a horrible nightmare that creeps me out just sharing the story. I even avoid talking or thinking about it due to weird feelings it gives me. I feel like part of my soul is gone forever. I can never take it back what I put my poor husband through. I'll never view things the same. I know there is real evil out there, and it wanted my soul. My dad grew up on a forestry in Queensland, Australia, as the son of a forest ranger. My whole life we've spent a lot of time out in that forest, camping and driving through parts of the forestry that only rangers would travel on occasionally. One place that my dad loved to take us was a little farm in the middle of the forest that was impossible to find unless you knew where it was. Locals knew the place as Spike's Hut. Spike was a local farmer who had lived there for decades until the 90s, and had a reputation for being abrasive, violent, bigoted, and not concerned with the laws of men. He had a habit of approaching guys in the bar who were wearing earrings and tearing them straight out and there were a few stories about people who displeased him disappearing. Basically, Spike was not a nice guy, and his farm hut reflected that pretty well. Dad would take us out there every time we visited the forest, and the hut would be more and more dilapidated, but the vibe was always the same. That straight up feeling of being watched, even though Spike was long gone. As I got older, I became more aware of the signs of life in the place when we went to the visit. There would be 44 gallon drums full of smashed beer bottles, fire pits with reasonably fresh coals. Someone was definitely out there. God knows why, since the place was literally a snake pit at that point, but that didn't seem too concerned. One trip when I was a teenager, things got strange real quick. My friends and I were piled into my dad's 4x4 and were driving through the bushes to Spikes so dad could tell his scary Spike stories and freak us out. We drove onto the property and something immediately caught my eye. Up on the hill opposite Spikes hut, there were what appeared to be a cowboy slumped against a log, hat over his face taking a nap. Something about his body position looked unnatural and uncomfortable. It wasn't the way you'd sit if you were taking a casual nap in the middle of work, and even if it was, there was no reason for anyone to be out there. The farm was long defunct, and there was no forest business to be taken care of by the property. I pointed it out to my dad, and instead of letting us get out the car at Spikes, as he usually did, he said he wanted to keep driving through the farm to show us something. He maintained that it was nothing, but that if the figure was still there when we came back, he'd stop and check it out. Of course, whatever he wanted to show us seemed totally made up as he drove us through the forest a bit. And when we came back, I spotted the slumped over cowboy again, not having moved an inch, still in the same unnatural position. I yelled out to dad to stop, reminding him of the promise, but instead he acted like he couldn't hear me locked the truck doors and drove off the farm faster than he'd ever driven on those dirt tracks before. My friends and I all looked at each other in confusion, 
But we all knew that when it came to this area, questioning my dad was futile and at best dangerous. My dad denied any of the events that day ever happening after that. But my friends and I were still curious about what was going on out there. So a few months later, we went camping on our own to see if we could find Spike's hut. It took hours of driving through the forest to find the gate to Spike's property. But eventually we found it without dad's help. Something was just off once we got there, more so than usual for that day. My mates jumped out the car, but were suddenly frozen, not wanting to walk any closer to the hut for no visible reason. The vibe was just wrong that day, and it felt like we had walked into something that didn't belong to us. The tug in my gut to get out was strong, but I'd spent two hours finding the place, and I was gonna explore it. One of my friends acted brave, and walked from the car to the hut with me, quietly acknowledging more and more signs of inhabitants, with nods between us. We said nothing to the others, but were on high alert. It felt like someone could be back any minute, or that they'd never left and were watching us as we poked around the debris. We walked up to the side of the hut to find a kind of small shed with three walls, and I heard my friend's voice go squeaky as he called me over to look inside. On the ground was a huge pile of ash from what looked like a cooking fire, and confirming this was the presence of a giant makeshift grill made from cross-hatched wire sitting over the fire, hinged on the shed wall. As I'm looking at this setup, I fear that whoever has been here has been hunting and cooking large chunks of their kill over the fire. Pretty clever, actually. But then my stomach dropped. As my eyes traveled down from the grill to the ground, I saw a baby sock, tiny, pink, and terribly out of place. Then another, then a shirt, a ribbon from a child's hair, all sitting right beside the ashes on the ground next to a woman's weekly Christmas cookbook. That's when the alarm bells in my head went off and I rounded up my mates to get out. Some ranger or crazy old bushy hanging out at that trashed hut was one thing, but there was absolutely no reason for a baby to be out there. There's no way anything good could have come from having a child's clothes right under a huge fire and grill. When we got back to the campground, we couldn't shake the rotten feeling of being watched, and all of us were so unsettled that we packed up our stuff and decided not to stay the night. When I got home, I told my dad about it, and he just shook it off, saying weird stuff happens out there. Being young and dumb, I never thought to look up missing persons in the area in an attempt to explain either the cowboy or the kid's clothes. But I can tell you, I will never make the mistake of going out to Spikes without my father again. This happened a number of years ago. I was walking with my two nephews, Richard and Jay. We were doing our normal route through the forest when we walked past a tree and saw some strange scratches on it. The thing is, we walk around here a lot and we'd never seen them before. They didn't appear to be human made or animal for that matter. We don't have any large animals where we live that could explain how they got there. We investigated a little bit and walked further. At least Richard and I walked further, while Jay stood next to the tree. We turned around, and at that moment heard a scream, and Jay came running for his life towards us. There was a stick that had flown towards him that had been launched at his neck. We calmed him down, checked his neck and didn't see anything, and walked towards the fence towards the back of the forest. We looked at the terrain when we saw a terrifying entity. It was all black, about two meters in length. Its legs, its arms, its fingers were longer than usual with these red glowing eyes. It was staring towards us. We were so scared we ran back to the beginning, went through the gate and just stood there for a few minutes. Jay said, my neck stings. Richard and I checked his neck and saw something at the spot where he was struck. It looked like the number seven. 
We took a picture, and after that, we spoke about what we saw. When we turned around, it was standing at the start of the forest, 20 meters between us. When the thing noticed that we had seen it, it vanished, running into the forest at inhuman speeds. We were so scared to go back in, and went back to our tents. Richard and Jay told their mum what happened, and she looked at Jay's neck. A scratch was still visible, but it was nearly gone. If anyone has ever experienced anything like this, I'd love to hear your story. Please, let me know. One time, me and two other friends from Miami went home to my home in Kansas to visit my grandmother because she wasn't doing well. She passed later that month. And one night, me and my friend went out on a drive while my other friend stayed with my grandma to check on her every once in a while. Me and my friend had went to go out. I don't remember to get what exactly, probably milk. We'd taken a wrong turn. At this part, it almost seemed like out of a movie. Our radio stopped working. It was about 10 p.m. and we were in the middle of a random dirt road in nowhere, Kansas. Me and my friend get out the car to see our surroundings because there wasn't service. And after about five minutes of being outside the car, we see a very large deer jumping around in the field to our right side. I get my buddy to look at the deer and he sees it. It was maybe 50 yards away from us, about half a football field. The deer has seen us too. It all goes silent. The deer starts to let out this loud scream that almost sounds like an elk, but a lot more human-like, which goes on for 15 seconds. And in the middle of it, he starts to stand on his two legs and runs at us. We get back in the car so quickly and drive away as fast as we can. And I remember distinctly that sometime in the middle of our panic, our radio starts to come on and it's playing a ward tour by a tribe called Quest. It was one of my favorite songs, but now I can't listen to it without remembering that scene. We came straight home and I pulled my friend to the side and me and my other friend tell him the story of what had happened. And throughout the whole time, he thought we were lying. I think at some point he started to believe the story, but it was by far the creepiest thing. I had ever seen. I just can't begin to describe how it was at least nine foot tall and running like a human on two legs. Such a distinctive scream. About three years ago, I went camping with my now ex girlfriend, as she had always expressed interests but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest, and is my go to trail slash camp spot, as it's hidden deep in the forest, and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs. My family had been going to this spot for about six years, and my friends that introduced me about 10 or so years. We went for the weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people that were hanging out next to our campsite, but they were just stargazing and ended up leaving. Then around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like someone was laughing at us, but the laughter never ended and got very high pitched and sounded as it kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try and sleep. And then that's when the laughing noise moved up higher, and they started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped and then started again around 3am. When it started again, the fire was going out. So I went to see if I should stoke the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something but I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This persisted until 6am and then stopped. And that finally was when we were able to get some rest. 
after we woke up, we checked around the campsite and didn't see anything out of the ordinary. So we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I start my vehicle and it's completely dead. That really freaked me out as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that killed the battery and made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged and yet somehow the battery still died. I was able to get a jump from a AAA. That phone call was hard to explain. And the lady who took the call didn't believe me. But in the end, we both laughed. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite and also had a cabin in the same forest about 25 miles away about what happened. And he got freaked out. He told me about two incidences which had happened, one at a campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated one night after we had all returned from the trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While he was hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance and saw a pair of eyes up in the trees looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent eyes and he flashed its high powered flashlights at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, they were there looking right back at him. So he packed up and went right to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother and they were both just chilling by the fire outside when they both saw a pair of eyes looking at them from the trail that leads into the woods. They stated that the height of the eyes were looking at them. Whatever it was had to be at least seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles and the eyes disappeared. But once they were done, they reappeared and were closer. At that point, they both freaked out and got back into the cabin and didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but I felt very scared when these events were happening. After we spoke about it, one of the brothers thinks it's a Wendigo. I really don't know what it could have been. All I know is that I haven't been that scared since. I have to preface this story by saying that yes, I was young and dumb and made some major mistakes here. I don't need any judgments. Trust me. I know how stupid I was, but on to the story. I was 18 years old and had just joined the army. I was doing my basic training in Georgia in the middle of summer. I was struggling with some mental issues at the time. And to make a long story short, I was in the process of getting chaptered out of the army, aka quitting. My squad mates and even drill instructors had all told me it was going to take months for me to get out. And I'd still be stuck there past Christmas. Mind you, this was June. I was very distraught about the thought of being stuck there forced to do meaningless chores till January, while my mental state deteriorated. But then a drill sergeant decided it would be fun to deceive me and convinced me that if I went AWOL, ran away and made it home, they would simply send me my discharge papers and I would be free. Looking back now, that was clearly a trick. But at the time I was desperate and bought into what he said. I hatched a plan to sneak out at night with a buddy from another unit. We were going to walk on the train tracks in the nearest town and catch a bus home. Easy enough, right? The night finally came for our escape. I snuck out of my barracks and headed to the meeting point. Upon arrival, I noticed my buddy wasn't there. And after waiting 30 minutes, I realized he wasn't coming. It was too late for me to try and sneak back in. So I was on my own. I headed to the tracks, made it right onto them and headed into what I thought was the direction of town. Boy, was I wrong. Walking on the tracks in the middle of the night, surrounded by woods was a bit creepy, but I figured it wouldn't be long and that I'd get to where I needed to be. After walking for over an hour, it hit me. Maybe these tracks weren't going to take me where I needed to go. And when I found a dirt path, I made the stupid decision to leave the tracks 
and follow that instead. The path led me past some fake houses set up for training and continued into the woods. This whole time, mind you, it's dark, and I have nothing but the moonlight to see with. I kept hearing noises in the woods and seeing shapes in the trees and bushes lining my path. Eventually on this path, I spotted some kind of wild dog wolf sitting just off the left side. By the time I had noticed it, it was too late to go back. My only option was forward. I faced the animal and backed up against the right side of the path as much as possible and slowly kept moving down it, never taking my eyes off the canine. Oddly, he never moved or showed aggression, just watched me as I inched by him, possibly because he was full or maybe he just wasn't interested in me. I honestly had no idea. After passing him, I continued until my path died and ended in a 50 foot drop. At this point, it had been hours. It was hot. I was alone, scared and thirsty. I had no idea where I was or what my next move should be. So I glanced around my surroundings and the only thing I could see besides the wood was a radio tower off in the distance to my right. Here is where I made my big mistake. I decided the radio tower couldn't be that far away, and someone had to be there to help me, right? So I left my path headed into the woods straight towards the radio tower. As you can imagine, it didn't take me long to realize once I headed into the woods that now not only was I lost, but I was lost in the almost pitch black woods with no way to find my way out. I continued to march in the direction I thought the tower might be in, slowly losing hope of ever seeing anyone again. Now tired and bleeding from my legs thanks to thorn bushes and my dumb idea of wearing shorts, I was on the brink of giving up. Where I came across a dry creek bed with a log in the middle, and out of frustration and hopelessness I climbed onto the log and screamed as loud as I could for someone to help me, which of course got no response. After several more screams, I heard a rustling in the bushes on the creek bank behind me, and I turned around just in time to see three wild dogs jump out of the bush and glare at me like I was dinner time. I absolutely lost it here. I ran in the opposite direction of them as I heard them taking off after me. I was terrified running through the darkness with them chasing me, screaming at the top of my lungs and thinking that this was going to be how I'd die, painfully torn apart by wild dogs in the woods and then eaten. I don't know how far or for how long I ran, but eventually I came to a down tree that was leaning on another and I scurried up praying they wouldn't climb it. I finally looked behind me and they were gone, nowhere to be seen. I wasn't sure if they had stopped chasing me, but I was relieved that I hadn't become their dinner. The rest of the night is mostly a blur of walking through dark woods and hearing other animals. At one point, I couldn't do it anymore and was just going to lay down and give up. As I sat down facing my own mortality, the thought hit me that they probably wouldn't even think to search the woods for me and that my family, friends and girlfriend would never have any idea of what truly became of me. That thought is what kept me going and made me continue to try and find my way out. Eventually the sun came up and I had survived the night. The lights brought with it some comfort since I could now see everything. After a few more hours, I stumbled upon a ribbon tied to a tree, which out here could only mean one thing a land navigation marker for training. I knew that if I kept following the ribbons, they would eventually lead me out. And eventually they did. I made it back to the path and ran into a sergeant who was heading out in his truck to go fishing. He returned me to my unit and I paid for my actions and was eventually discharged. I learned a lot from this experience and have a wonderful life now. And I'm thankful for every day that I'm alive and will never go into the woods again without a flashlight. While this experience was terrifying and life-changing, 
I am glad I went the wrong way on that track and didn't make it a wall, or I would have gone to jail and not been where I am today. Labor Day of 2015. My mother, my wife, and my three children and I went to a very remote cabin that we rented out. It was an old fire watchman station or something of the sort. So I had the cabin and three other sheds slash shops. I'll try to keep it short. But this is a bizarre story. We unpacked, settled into the cabin and then decided to walk a few hundred yards down the river barefoot. We got down to the pebbled shore and were playing slash throwing rocks when I realized there were about one foot snakes everywhere. My wife, mum, and I yanked up the three kids and boogied off. After reaching a safe distance from them, I went back with a water bottle and caught one to see what it was. Turns out we were in a nest of diamondback rattlesnakes. If one of these things latched onto one of my kids, they surely would not have survived. We were three hours away from any medical facility. We got back to the cabin and my mum and I went for a hike slash walk alone while my wife calmed the kiddos and fed them lunch. Upon returning 15 minutes later, all three of my kids and wife were inside with the doors and windows closed, even though we had left everything open for the place to cool off. We went inside to hear all four of them start yelling about a bear that was 150 yards from the cabin, huffing and puffing at the wife and kids on the front porch, eating. It was down by the river another 30 or so yards from the hill, and he poked his head up over and over. A few hours go by, and in that time an ATV passed three times with two inbred looking freaks upon it. And each time they stopped in front of the gate onto the property and stared at us in the cabin. Keep in mind we're two hours into the wilderness in Idaho, with no sight of a person the whole entire trip except for them. We decided it's bedtime for the kids and it's pitch blackout. Within 10 minutes, our son of five went from being perfectly fine to having a fever of 103, slightly foaming at the mouth and being completely unresponsive. It was at that point we decided to leave immediately and go seek medical attention. I opened the front door to the cabin and started loading the two cars by the light of the porch. And that's when all three of us heard about four to six large and heavy animals running all around the cabin and the property. There was one on the right side of the house that I could hear pacing back and forth and breathing heavily. I made everyone stay indoors and close the door every time. And I went to transfer stuff to the cars. I had a stick and a big pot that I was smacking as hard as I could. And each time was yelling out loudly and randomly. As soon as I'm done loading, I take each kid out individually and load them up between the two cars, then escort my mum out and wife. My wife and I were in the lead car. So we pulled up out of the gate and for some stupid reason or another, I felt that I needed to close it. So I got out of my vehicle, walked behind it and my mum's car and closed it. Now this gate was literally a log that slid from one post to the other. It offered zero protection or barrier between me and the animals out there. And right as I went to turn around, I heard a large padded foot walk up to me directly in front of me then more than 10 feet away. Then I see eyes shimmering from the moonlight as the deepest, scariest growl I've ever heard in my life. I turn and run so fast, I swear I must have jumped from where I was to the driver's seat up to the car some 30 feet behind me. And as I landed in the seat, I slammed into drive and spun out, finally leaving. About 15 minutes down the road, we were still panicking about our unresponsive son and we both kept having this horrible, evil, doom feeling like a shadow over us. I looked down and realized I still had that baby rattlesnake in the water bottle in my cup holder. So I grabbed it and threw it out the window immediately. 
Not even two minutes later, we heard our son softly crying. We realized he was responsive, and he stated something along the lines of, "Why are we leaving? What's going on?" He was sad because he was sad to leave. He couldn't remember the last hour or so at all. My mother was about fifty-eight years old at the time, and has been a Jehovah's Witness my whole life, plus many more years beforehand. And she's the last person in the world that would believe in signs or evil or omens or whatever. The next day, my mum broke down extremely bad, sobbing her eyes out, hardly able to talk. And she confessed to my wife that the night before we left, she had a nightmare in which we went on a camping trip, came across snakes, a bear, and a pack of wolves. She said she knew a lot of bad things happened at that outpost, and it was full of evil. Most of all, she said, "One of your kids passed away." I swear on my life to this very day, if I ask her who passed and how it happened, she immediately starts crying and refuses to talk of it. She lives her life now with a guilt that she willingly ignored her nightmare and put us in this situation, nearly taking one of her dear grandkids away from the world. She doesn't deserve to feel like that. I know all of this sounds crazy, but a week later on the local news were reports of a wolf pack in that area. Wolves and bears may not coexist in harmony, but they do share territories and respect each other. This outpost station of sorts was about an hour and a half into the wilderness from Lowman slash Banks, Idaho. If you want to verify, the animals actually exist around there. Sadly, I grew up in the mountains for most of my pre-slash early teen years, as did my wife until she was ten years old, and even have a half sleeve of the wilderness slash trees on my left arm. But with that said, we don't care to go to the mountains anymore. I was nine years old, and camping out with three families other than my own. I was sleeping in a small tent with one of my close friends when something woke me up. I listened and heard nothing from outside at first, so I opened up the tent zipper enough to see the fire was out, and knew the adults must be asleep. I closed the zipper and laid back down. Shortly after I lied down, I heard a high-pitched voice from outside the tent telling me to come out and play. I would have thought it was a person. But it was repeating itself over and over, and moving close to the tent, that was then far away, all the while circling it. I opened the tent and looked out, but it was pitch black. At this point, I tried to wake the friend I was in the tent with, but he pushed me off. I tried again more violently this time, and he woke up. I told him I heard something outside. But he must have not been fully awake yet, because he just mumbled something and laid back down. After I spoke to my friend and tried to go to sleep, the same voice kept me up. Next morning, I told my friend, who had been in the tent, about it, and he said he remembered being annoyed that I woke up. So to me, that means I wasn't dreaming. I'm almost certain I was fully awake, so I doubt I hallucinated it. I know this doesn't have a satisfactory ending, but that is my real ghost story. I'm a 25-year-old, and even though these events happened 11 years ago, I still remember them very clearly. This is by far the creepiest thing I've ever experienced. When I was 14, my family and I moved out of town. Into a small house situated right in the middle of a cane field. There was a dirt road that led from the main road to the front of our house, and the sides and back were surrounded by cane. I was what my parents called a fitness freak, because exercise was my thing. So I took my dog Jet and went jogging early mornings and late afternoons every single day. Because we had just moved to this house, and it being surrounded by cane and all, I had to find a new track to continue my routine. Our house was two stories high, and my bedroom window faced the front of our house, so I could see the main road. 
after finally moving in my stuff and setting up my bedroom at the new house, I noticed from my window that there was a little dirt road on the side of the main road. Perfect, I thought. It was about 5.30 in the afternoon, the usual time I would go for my jog. So I would go and check it out. The road was long and narrow, fitting no more than one car, as there were rows of cane on either sides that stood tall and well above my head. I had been jogging for about 15 minutes, and looking back, I could no longer see the main road as this track was straight, but then slightly curved, leading me up towards another house. I could only see the roof of this house in the distance, as the cane was still very high. As I got closer, I noticed a little boy in a red shirt sitting on the top of her roof. He looked about five or six. That's weird, I thought. I remember thinking how on earth did he climb up there? And if his parents knew he was there, because not only is the roof visible over the cane, as it was obviously a two story home. So I stopped jogging and called my dog back who was running a few meters ahead of me and turned around to go back. I wasn't interested in going all the way up to the house, just in case I'd be trespassing on private property or if they had dogs as mine didn't get on with other pets very well. When I got home, my dad was sitting on the couch watching TV. I asked him if he knew the family who lived up on the opposite dirt road. Nah, no one lives up there, he told me. Well, there must be someone who lives there, I say. I just saw a little boy sitting on the roof. My dad looked at me and lowered his eyebrows as if he didn't believe me. No, Tory. No one lives there. It used to be an old workhouse that farmers used to store their tractors and working equipment in. I was so confused, questioning whether I had just imagined a little boy sitting up there. My 12 year old sister then walked out the bathroom drying her hair with her towel. Gemma, come jogging with me in the morning? Uh, why? Because I need to see if I'm just imagining something. Okay. First thing in the morning, I dragged Gemma to come along. We left the dog at home just in case there really were people living there. So what were you imagining? Yesterday, I went jogging on this road and down the end was a house with a little boy sitting on the roof. So, so dad is saying that no one lives there and it's bothering me. We get close enough to where the roof was finally visible and there was no little boy in sight. Let's go all the way in then, Gemma said, and I hesitantly followed. When we got there, it became pretty clear that there couldn't possibly be anyone living there. To try and describe it as best I can, it was a large two story house covered in black streaks, as if it had been burnt down once before, and had three large square gaps on the front that clearly used to be windows. The stairs to get inside were at the back of the house, and behind that was a small murky colored lake. It seemed definitely abandoned, and like it hadn't been used in many years. My dad was right about it being once used as a storage place for farmers. Around the yard were old tires, tractors and cars. In all honesty, the whole place was straight up creepy. This is gonna sound weird, but do you have a bad feeling? Jim had looked at me for a moment before agreeing. Um, Tori? Is that the little boy? She said, her voice shaking. Before I got a chance to answer where, Gemma was pointing towards a small room downstairs with a smashed hole in the window. Through the window, there was a little boy sitting there. We both stared in shock for at least another second before bolting back down the road. We got home, bursted through the door, telling mum and dad what we'd seen. Dad laughed. I told you girls no one lives there. I was getting frustrated. Dad, seriously, Gemma saw him too. They both brushed it off and didn't think much of it. Being dumb teenagers and all. Gemma and I decided to go back in the afternoon to the house with the dog. When we got back there, we checked where we had seen the boy in the morning, but he was gone. Jet was going crazy. We unclipped his leash from his collar 
and he took off running behind the house and the upstairs. We called out to him, but he wasn't coming back. Great, now we have to go get him. We walked around the back and started slowly walking upstairs. They were old, rickety, and creaking with every step. Gemma got up the stairs before me, because admittedly I was scared, and I was only halfway up before Gemma called out, Oh my god, Tori, you have to see this. I walked straight in as the front door was missing, and I had chills. On the dusty old floorboards was kids' crayon scribbles and a small blue shoe. If only dad could see this. I immediately wanted to leave, but Gemma was still calling out to Jet, and he hadn't returned. We walked through the kitchen, and into an open room of the house, and found Jet sitting there staring at a large cardboard box that was at least a meter tall. We looked inside, and it was full to the brim of blank videotapes. Every part of me was screaming to get out. Gemma looked at me and slowly reached in to grab a tape, when we heard quick and heavy footsteps coming from the front of the house, exactly as if someone was running towards us. We both panicked and got the hell out of there. It was late in the afternoon, and it was starting to get dark. It started pouring with rain as we were running away. And as we got further down the road, we looked back, seeing a few shapes of large men standing in the gaps of the windows watching us. When we got home, we were sweaty, and so far out of breath trying to explain to mum and dad what we had seen. Videotapes? That's weird, dad said. Mum wasn't so interested, so she chose not to believe us. We explained that when Gemma tried to pick up a tape, we heard what sounded like someone coming towards us, even though it was now dark outside. My dad suggested he would go for a drive to the house and have a look. For some reason, even though Gemma and I were absolutely scared out of our minds, we decided to go with him. We drove up slowly through the dirt road as it was dark and eerie, and all we could see was the gravel of the road directly in front of the car where the headlights shone. We pulled up at the house thinking it was scary enough during the day, but it was like going to a horror movie during the night. We sat in the car with the headlights shining directly onto the old creepy house, and darkness surrounding elsewhere. My dad, Gemma and I almost jumped out of our skin, and I swear for a second that my heart stopped beating. It was the sound of a gunshot. It sounded like it was shot no more than a few meters from our car. At that moment, Dad immediately put the car into reverse and spun it around, about to drive off when he just stopped still. My heart was about to beat out my chest and I yelled, Dad, what are you doing? Gemma was almost crying in the front seat. I looked at both of them, and they were both doing nothing but staring directly in front of the car. So, this thing I noticed on the way there, was since it had rained a bit earlier, there were no tracks or anything marked on the road, since they were washing away by the rain. So our tyre tracks were the only ones. Then I saw it. Sitting perfectly upright, on top of our tyre tracks was a bullet shell. It's safe to say we never came back to that house, as it's quite obvious we were not wanted there. I began jogging on a track from the back of our house, and have had a much better experience. But still to this day, so many questions remain in my head. I wonder what the hell would have been on those tapes? Why there was an entire box full of them? Who did they belong to? And why were they being so protected? The events described here took place in a small country in Northern Europe, sometime between 2008 and 2009, during the middle of the summer. I was about 17 years old back then, and spent a better part of the summer vacation helping my dad. He was a logger and his workday, as well as mine, started very early in the morning. We would wake up just before 4am, have a quick breakfast with coffee, dress up, get our gear, 
and drive out to the forest, which was around 15 to 20 kilometers away. My family lived in a rather small town surrounded by crop fields and forestry, near the country's border, and the aforementioned trip meant you would get far enough from civilization. Poor, often disappearing south signal, old overgrown roads and absolutely no one who lives there. No one for you to meet, on your way to the felling. That's what they call a territory where loggers cut trees. To get to it, we need to park our 4x4 truck on the side of a narrow road, walk 2 kilometers through thick overgrowth, and then climb down a steep hill. The route to this particular felling did stand out though. On our way there, we would pass an old, long abandoned house that got my attention the first time I made this trip with my father. Judging by the appearance of the house, it was built at least 80 years ago, definitely before Soviet occupation, which meant that it could have been nationalized with the original owners possibly being deported after 1940. All of the windows were gone, as well as the window frames. The roof was also gone, but you could still make out the individual rooms because the walls and the floor of this house were still somewhat structurally sound. You could also make out a yard that was hidden beneath the overgrowth. On one of our trips, I noticed some posters and magazines lying on the floor in one of the rooms. It was from around the 80s, so I figured that was the last time someone had lived there. It was quite unsettling to find this abandoned property in the middle of nowhere. But it was only after our fourth or fifth trip that I realized its probable importance. We got to Felling, worked for about three hours and decided to take lunch. It was a clear sunny morning with no one around. Me and my dad sat on one of the bigger trees that we cut down previously and proceeded to chow down on our sandwiches, taking occasional sips of coffee. Then it began. Suddenly we both heard a dog barking somewhere in the distance. This was already weird since we never heard anything other than the ambience of the forest the previous days here. What made this even stranger was the fact that the barking noise was coming from within the forest, the part we had yet to chop down and saw our way into. Me and my dad both stopped eating, looked at each other, and without saying a word agreed that we would keep listening, and turned our heads towards the forest from where the occasional bark was coming. I eventually said, must be a stray dog or something, or maybe someone lives nearby. My dad nodded in affirmation. As we resumed our lunch, it became clear that the barking was nearing our position, and now it was accompanied by distinct human-like footsteps, breaking branches, shoving leaves, and so on. It unnerved me a bit, but I quickly realized that soon enough, somebody would definitely emerge from the forest probably someone else who was logging near us, although it would not explain the dog, as taking your pet to the felling would be very unusual, not to mention potentially dangerous for the animal. The barking continued, and the footsteps got louder and closer, close enough that both the person and the dog should be clearly visible. The sound stopped around 30 to 32 yards from where we sat, then resumed. Me and my dad kept looking in that direction and seeing absolutely nothing. The footsteps and the barking carried on. These sounds now came from a cleared out area where we should not have been able to see anyone or anything that stood or moved. We looked at each other in complete bewilderment and didn't speak. I could even hear the dog panting and sniffing around with an occasional step being taken by apparently no one. After 40 seconds, the sound indicated that this, whatever this was, was moving away from us. Not back where it came from, but to the left. Soon enough, the sounds got very faint and disappeared. Me and my dad exchanged a few quick theories, but it was clear that neither of us understood what we had just experienced. We resumed work and left the place around the time we usually did. And I passed the house described earlier, and got chills thinking that maybe what we witnessed is somehow connected to this haunting abandoned property. I should state that we were both well rested that day, 
and used to this type of work. This took place before I started using alcohol, and my dad had been a non drinker all his life. I should also mention that neither of us are a skeptic. I have an open mind to these type of things, and they interest me. I've read up on it, but we certainly don't spend much time talking of it. This is one of the creepier things that has happened to me. And I often wonder if it was a ghost and his dog returning to their abandoned property. I went hiking out in the wilderness on the outskirts of Yuma, and walked about five miles from my car to my campsite. I brought my usual hiking gear along with my AR-15 for protection against wild animals like coyotes or snakes. My firewood supply burned up just after the sun went down. So I went to bed at around 630. Messed around on my phone till 730 passed out and was awoken at 830 by a call from our mutual friend and fell asleep again. The next time I woke up, I couldn't move. I could hear rocks moving outside and soft footfalls in the sand right outside my tent. I heard coyotes howling earlier. So I knew that's what these were. I was sleeping with my back to the wall of the tent. And one of them pressed their nose into my back and sniffed for a good minute. I had sleep paralysis again. And I couldn't even grab my rifle to shoot them. The second thing happened a few hours later. There are two sections of my tent that can be seen through. It had to be a dream. But I woke up and peered through the window and I saw a young woman and a child sitting outside my tent on a small rise not more than six feet away. I asked them who they were. And the child was silent. But the woman declared, leave this place. They made a horrifying face. And as I went to grab my rifle, I tried to pull the trigger. But it dawned on me that something was terribly wrong and the trigger wouldn't budge. And then the child stood at once, walked away into the shrub trees behind my tent. And the woman walked on until I couldn't see her anymore. But the child passed out from under the moonlight into the shadow of the shrub tree. And because there was moonlight falling on the other side, I could watch her silhouette change shape. She became a gangly bony freak almost like a tall monkey absolutely silent. And she rushed my tent. I squeezed the trigger for all its worth. And then she collided with my tent. In that instant, I woke up screaming and throwing a wild punch at the wall of the tent. I think whatever it was followed me. I've never been hiking to that spot again. And maybe never will try again. My aunt, my brother, my cousin and I were visiting our grandparents house in Washington. They lived in a pretty remote area with only a handful of other houses around and a good chunk of forest between each of them. Keep in mind it also is kind of an island. So they don't get many funky creatures there. My aunt and I went out while it was dark outside, just walking the path into the forest and trying to figure out what was making a loud noise. Anywho, we passed a pond area and made our way to a clearing. When we reached said clearing, I started immediately getting a bad feeling. I figure, you know, it's dark and I'm quite scared of the dark and I'm tired, but nothing's really going to happen. The path was a bit overgrown around there, so we decided to turn around. Right before we did, though, I caught a glimpse of what could have been a really big owl up in the trees just staring at us. Now I'm an Arizona girl, so I don't know what creatures are normal in this forest. But this thing just didn't feel right to me. It gave me a weird vibe. But my aunt kept walking and I caught up. Keep in mind the path was very short. It only takes about 10 ish minutes to get to the clearing and tend to walk back. But when we approached the house, we heard my grandma yelling for us. We run back. And she is anxious saying we've been gone for hours. We swear we'd only been there for half an hour at most. 
and when my brother and cousin come back, they tell us they'd been out looking for us. We check the time. They're right. Another interesting thing that could be connected, a few days before that, we had heard some really funky noises coming from the woods while we were out there making s'mores. Even my grandparents who had lived there longer than I've been alive, admit that it was unlike anything they'd heard before. It continued getting closer and closer and stopped any time someone tried to get a video of it. Eventually I had to go inside because it was freaking me out so bad. That loss of time though still gets to me, especially considering that I don't have an explanation. Was it the owl or the woods? I guess I'll never know. This took place a few years ago with my best friend. We decided to go camping in Flagstaff, a place called Locket Meadow. We'd taken our dogs and after a day of hiking and exploration, we played around a fire and eventually went to sleep. I woke up in the middle of the night to find this deep figure outside our tent, burying itself into our tent. It had a weird way of hovering back and forth over my body and my dog who had curled up awake and was not moving or making a sound at the bottom of my feet. I looked over and seen my best friend passing out and his dog, which I'm sure if it was awake, but clearly I'm the only one between my friend and I'm expecting this terrifying encounter. I eventually cover my head and thought about anything to make me fall asleep. The next day I asked my friend if he had somehow been awake throughout it all. And he said no, and thought I was lying. I told him maybe it was a bear. So we looked around our campsite and couldn't find anything, no trails, no prints, nothing. We also had our food out on a table near our tents and a trash bag hung up on a broken branch. So even if it was a bear, I'm surprised it didn't get any of our stuff. Either way, I remember how scared I was seeing this dark weird object observing our tent. It could have been the wind, a deer, a bear, who knows? But this is just one encounter of the whole camping trip. The next night we decide to camp at Beaver Creek. Mind you, we're in Arizona, if you wish to know. However, before we were settled in, we explored Sedona and we drove to Oak Creek and parked our car near a trail down to the water. We took our dogs and hiked the creek. After we finished jumping in and swimming and drying off, we were about to head out. And the next thing you know, we see from the corner of our eye, a big rock being thrown near us making a big splash in the water. We look up and can't see anything. So we run over the stones to get a clear view and see no one. We yell out foul words and hear no one running off or anything. When we got to our next campsite at Beaver Creek and set up, my friend told me throughout the trip since we started in Flagstaff, he'd had rocks being thrown at him up until that large rock at Oak Creek. We looked at each other and thought maybe someone was following and messing with us. We sort of laughed it off and said that it was impossible and that we were going to try and connect the dots. Well, I'm glad nothing else happened. And the next day we packed up and went home with nothing but a memory to be justified. I went to high school in a small Minnesota town, mostly farmland intersected by wooded areas and of course dozens of small lakes. One side of my neighborhood was bordered by a relatively large marshland that you could access by a slope that wound down to a trail. This trail curved through the marsh into a big patch of woods about three quarters of a mile away. In the fall slash spring after heavy rains, a fog would often settle over the marsh as it was much lower than the surrounding area. And it truly looked like something out of a Stephen King novel. After one of these rains, my brother and I, he was probably 13 and I 16, decided it would be a great idea to go explore the woods in the fog. Although the sun was setting fast, we knew that we could make it to the woods in about 10 minutes if we left immediately. 
we grabbed a couple of flashlights, knowing that it would be dark by the time we got home and headed for the trail. Once we were in the trail and moving, it just hit us how thick this fog was. We only had been walking for about a minute or two, but we had absolutely no visibility left behind us, and 5 to 10 feet max in front of us. We continued walking for a few more minutes, chatting about hearing noises and seeing red eyes in the distance the whole time, until we came to a curve in the trail. This curve signaled that we were only about 100 yards from the entrance to the woods. At this point, there's a small lake on the left side of the trail, and miles of marshland on the right. It's important to note that we have moved further and further away from any house. Our house was the closest to the trail, and the trail moved away from our neighbourhood rather than bordering any backyards. We began walking past the lake, and then we heard a splash, definitely larger than a fish jumping, but we had no idea what else would have made that noise. We stopped, waited, and upon hearing nothing else, continued on our way. We couldn't have been gone for more than 15 seconds, when we heard cracking and shuffling in the brush up ahead of us to our left. We stopped dead in our tracks and waited. At the end of our eyesight, which could have only been about 10 feet, a figure stepped out from the brush bordering the lake. The fog was too thick to make out many details, but it must have been at least 6 foot 4 and very broad shouldered. As the figure made its way into the middle of the trail, my brother gasped and it stopped. Its head shot over, and looked right at us and just stared. It felt like an eternity, but it couldn't have been more than a few seconds. I felt true horror at that moment, and I've never replicated that feeling. I began to take a small step backwards and suddenly, the figure took off running into the marshland. Again, there are no houses or buildings or anything for miles in the direction that it ran. Suffice to say, my brother and I sprinted back to the house faster than I've ever done before. I still don't know who or what I saw that day. I hope I never do. When I was working as a backpacking guide in Western North Carolina, my schedule dictated a full eight-day shift with six days off. During those six days, myself and other co-workers would play in the woods. In the summer, you couldn't beat a mountain swimming hole. One of my favourites was called Paradise Falls, alternatively named Wolf Creek Falls. This is a cliff jumping spot with a huge swimming area, a tiny slot canyon, and an inner pool. Most will venture to do the small jump into the inner pool, even though it's the smallest jump, it's arguably the least accessible. Even though the jump is 9 feet at most, you must work through a 10 minute rock scramble to get to the top of it. We were all venturing in, and from inside the tiny canyon you can't see the main pool. Well, we got to the jump, and coaxed the first person off, a fellow guide who had never been to the spot before. She jumped successfully and swam out into the main pool and beach area, and then she screamed. Because she was now out of sight, myself and another guy jumped in together and swam the short distance to her with the others in tow. Of course, we figured she was somehow injured. She was treading water and just staring wide-eyed at the riverbank. When I looked to the shore, there stood a man. He was massively large, easily six foot six with a little change. He wore beat up overalls and no shirt, and there didn't appear to be a hair on him. Perhaps the most disturbing thing was that he had folds of skin all over his body. Imagine the Michelin man, but made of flesh. His face, his arms, chest, everything had a uniformed layer of shingled fat rolls, and he was brandishing a firearm. The area around Wolf Creek is just holler after holler, but there are a few residences, and those few have been there for generations, propagated by the same families. These people don't like outsiders, and so they keep relations within the family. I could only surmise that this individual was the product of inbreeding over decades. 
He just stood there and watched as we scrambled to grab anything important and shoved it in the bag. He just stood there and watched as we hightailed it out of that basin and back towards the parking area. The whole time, he never said a word. Bear in mind, it's public land. So me, my boyfriend, his best friend and his girlfriend drove up to Big Bear. Then, a day later, another friend of ours drove up and he was supposed to sleep downstairs and couple sleep upstairs since there are only two bedrooms in the Airbnb. The first night we stayed there, it was kind of creepy because the cabin was pretty remote. And of course, there's absolutely no light outside. It's in the woods with coyotes howling and bears, but nonetheless, completely normal activity. The next night at midnight, my boyfriend and I are in bed when suddenly our friend sleeping downstairs comes banging on the door, freaking out, saying he saw shadows in the woods and that the motion lights came on and there was thumping outside. We got a little freaked out, but my boyfriend gets out of bed and checks the entire cabin and even goes outside. There's nothing. We go up to the other couple's room where there's a porch with a sliding glass door that looks out into the woods. It's important to note that I'm naturally very anxious and scared while my boyfriend is a rock. He's calm and logical while I tend to jump to the worst scenario. My boyfriend goes over to check the last place in the cabin. So he pulls the curtain and jumps and yells, Oh my God. At this point, I'm terrified. My boyfriend is 180 pounds and a CrossFit coach. And to see a big guy like that scared is nauseating. He locked the door and started backing away slowly. There's a large man standing outside staring at us. He's just standing in the woods staring. At this point, I think he's messing with me. Go lock the door, he says to me. That's when I knew he was serious. Everyone is freaking out. I run and lock the door behind us, and we all decide to stay in the room to keep an eye out. It's the middle of summer, and it's really hot, but we refuse to open a window. I'm so scared, but trying not to show it as everyone else seemed to have calmed down. Half hour goes by and nothing happened. I get annoyed with the heat and the fact that there are five people in a tiny room and three of them are men. So my boyfriend and I go back to our room. I'm still pretty spooked. So my boyfriend tries to cheer me up. At this point, it's about 1.30, and I told him I was too scared to sleep with the lights off. He tells me that's totally fine and he understands. So we just lay with the lights completely on. Finally, I start drifting to sleep when I hear a thud. I sit up and look at my boyfriend and then he looks at me and the power cuts. I immediately start sobbing. I'm trembling. I can't see anything because it's pitch black. I try to get out of bed and run, but my legs get tangled in the sheets and I fall. My boyfriend picks me up. We grab our phone, run to the other room where everyone else was staying. And I'm hysterical at this point. I try to contact our host, but nothing will go through. I try to call my dad, but all of our phones say no service. We are there alone. Thank God the friend who drove up after us had a different carrier because his phone had one bar. So he calls the local sheriff. He's on the phone with him and they transfer us to the utilities company. We give the address and they tell us that we're too far in the woods and they don't cover that area. At this point, we're wondering if the entire area has no power or if the man outside had just cut our power. I cry more and we call 911 to report suspicious activity and power outage and they send in the fire department. A few hours go by and it's 3 a.m and suddenly the power comes back on. We fall asleep and the next day we spoke to some of the locals in the area. We told them our power went out and he said that was strange and shouldn't have happened. He told us the only reason that happens out here is because of a snowstorm and he couldn't explain it. I'm pretty sure it was the creepy man in the woods. In any case, I really would rather never meet again. 
I consider myself open-minded and I'm extremely skeptical and rational. I grew up in a hippie household and my parents always tried to convince me of some alleged new age shocking truth. But since my teens, I with respect and determination decided to embrace a more scientific mindset. I really like literature and gothic dark stories though. And whenever the ghost topic comes up, I'm always happy to share the following. In the summer of 2006, I was 16. And as every year was spending the holidays in camping in southern Italy, a huge piece of Hector Ridge and hectares of pine trees and Mediterranean scrub with a nice sandy beach nearby. I was having a good time doing the things teenagers always do in such places. Swimming, cycling, kissing boys next to the bonfire and just hanging out. One night I was returning to my place, prepared to silently sneak into my tent when I decided to stop by the bathroom before bed. It was four o'clock. I remember the hour exactly, as that's the time that the public lights were turned down. Street lights just went off when I arrived to the bathroom. It was a big building on the side adjacent to the street and the men's shower and bathroom was on the opposite side to the ladies. Approaching the building, I noticed a blonde girl outside the men's showers, turning her back to me. The sight was a tad unusual. I thought she could have just been waiting for her father or brother to come out the restroom. I had had to come close to her as I needed to turn the corner to reach the ladies. I kept feeling like something was off. And just as I was turning the corner, I looked back at her, unsure if asking her if she needed something. In a split second, I saw her face changing. From the moment I noticed this girl, to maybe a minute later, the change had happened considerably. I saw her jawbone protrude in an unnatural manner, giving her a beastly appearance. It's hard to explain what I saw as it was just a glimpse of a few seconds. I felt like a bucket of cold ice had been poured over me. And I went ahead, too scared to look behind my back. I kept walking on the side of the building, and soon reached the other corner and the ladies bathroom. I was terrified. And not a chance I was going to actually enter and lock myself inside a bathroom with God knows what. This side of the building was next to another street that allowed me to return to my place for a longer path. I reached my tent and waited for the sunrise trying to calm down. To this day, this is the experience that comes to mind when people talk about the paranormal. I believe it is absolutely possible that I just imagined the whole thing with the complicity of darkness and me being tired. But it was just such a strange sense and really gave me chills. The second experience happened years before this one. It's not as striking. In any case, I was about 13 and going back after school. I grew up in a very rural area of Tuscany. And my house is three kilometers from the nearest village where the school bus stopped. My mother was a few minutes late to catching me. But I didn't mind as it was a beautiful spring day and I was expecting her to arrive soon. I walked away from the main road towards my house direction, looking at the fields on the other side and towards the hill where my mother's car should have descended when I felt something wasn't okay. A mild sensation actually just as something was out of place. I noticed movement from the corner of my eye as I turned and realized there was a tall blonde dog with his front paws on my backpack. I screamed more because of the surprise other than the dog. And he quickly walked away with his tail and ears low, as dogs usually do when people yell at them. I didn't think much of this. And it's not strange to meet a dog without an owner. I carried on walking. And after a short time felt again that weird sensation and immediately turned my head. I saw the dog sitting on top of my backpack. I yelled and was scared and threw the backpack on the floor. I don't remember what happened next. I guess my mother arrived shortly after and I went ahead with her for the day. It sounds absolutely so weird. This whole thing probably happened around six or seven years ago. 
I lived in the middle of nowhere in Ohio and had to make my own fun growing up. I was around 16 at the time and my friends and I decided to start ghost hunting on the weekends. We've experienced small stuff here and there, nothing too insane until we went to Rogue's Hollow. Now, Rogue's Hollow was this old mining town where there were fires, diseases, etc. that eventually made the town cease to exist. It's now a national or state park. I'm not sure one of the two. But anywho, we decided it's worth exploring. First off, this place is in the middle of absolutely nowhere. I drove a 98 Chrysler Concorde in those days. And when it was an absolute chore getting there. The gang shows up, there's a total of four of us and it's getting pretty late. And we notice the house slash lodge where the park ranger stays. So we park a bit off to avoid getting caught. The gang shows up, there's a total of four of us. It's getting pretty late and we notice the house slash lodge where the park ranger stays. So we park a bit off to avoid getting caught. Didn't work out too well. Five minutes later, we're being questioned by an old guy who was the lone park ranger. He ended up being pretty cool and telling us some of his personal experiences. He said we could continue if we promised not to do any witchcraft or satanic rituals. Apparently that was a big problem that he was dealing with. At this point, we ventured back into the woods where the town previously was and stuff started getting weird. We could hear what sounded like pickaxes, men working and voices in many different directions. Needless to say, we were getting a bit on edge and decided to start recording our own little EVP device to see if we could find any stuff. We were getting words like fire, death, devil, and collapse. Eventually, we stumbled on an old house. It definitely wasn't inhabitable and was about 50% burnt down, while the others stayed back. As we approached the door, we turned back to our friends to give the old wish us luck, and they were sheet white looking at the second story building. Directly above us, looking out the window down at us, was a man from the shoulders up and slightly transparent. Then he disappeared. Not leaning back into the house, he was simply gone. Usain Bolt would have been proud of my sprint time leaving that place. Fast forward to the next day and we're deciding to go back and explore in broad daylight. We were walking around in two groups, about 10 yards apart from one another. I was in the back too, about 100 yards in from the wood line. And all of a sudden, my friend and I both get grabbed on our shoulders simultaneously, hearing a very soft but distinctive, Hello. At this time, we turned and booked it out of there. And I haven't been back since. This happened a number of years ago. I was working in a rundown factory that had long since been abandoned. But we had been paid to make sure that no trespassers got onto the property. We had to do rounds every once in a while. And I have to admit, I had slacked the last few hours and written everything off as fine. It was a tiresome job. It was starting to get light outside. And I could see streams of sunlight start to make their way up past the horizon. This was always a good sign, as it meant my shift would be over soon. At 7am, sweet freedom awaited me. So I thought in order to just finish off the books, I do one final round of the facility. It takes about 15 minutes to go around, which in fairness isn't very much. But it's just a bit of an annoying walk due to there being debris and things you have to climb over occasionally if you don't take the longer route round. I grab my flashlight and walk out as it's still quite dark and do the usual route, looking around. Keep in mind I'd been doing this job for about a year now, and nothing at all remotely creepy had ever happened. About eight minutes into the walk, roughly halfway, I'm just minding my own business looking around when I hear what sounds like footsteps. I instantly shine my flashlight up to the second level of the factory. I can't see anything 
but the footsteps are loud, like they're hitting metal. Now, the floor of the factory is definitely not metal. So I found this quite peculiar. I shout out to whoever's there to reveal themselves so they don't face prosecution charges. But I don't hear anyone. I know at this point I'm going to have to go in. So I grab my key and slot it into the nearest door and make my way up. I climb the stairs, which echo loudly with the sound of my feet hitting them. I knew that this would scare whoever was there as they usually need to run down these stairs to exit as the other side is quite far away and depending on what they know about the factory means that I have the advantage here. I make my way up, trying to corner my prey, listening out to see who's there and there isn't anyone. No noise can be heard. I do a whole run of the floor, floor above and floor below no one to be found. It took me about an hour to clear everything. I was quite shocked. But I assumed that they had gotten away last minute, lock the door and write it off as that and try and find where they could have breached but couldn't find the location. I make it back and start searching the video security footage to see where they could have come in from. When I get up the second floor roughly at the time I was there, I scroll through the images, and although I can hear a brief bang, the one that alerted me originally, I still couldn't find the origin of the sound. It left me puzzled, and when my relief came, I tried not to dwell on it and went home. Still, it's one of the weirdest things that happened, and none of my other co-workers have said to experience anything similar before or since. I heard it on the tapes, so I know it's real. I wonder what it could have been. When I lived in rural Maine, my boyfriend at the time took me on a drive in his truck. He wanted to show me something he said he learned about from one of his college professors. We already kind of lived in the middle of nowhere, but we drove even further into literally nowhere. We were on this road that was five to eight miles of just forest on both sides. No houses, no signs, no driveways, nothing. Then he pulls over near a slight break in the trees. There was a very overgrown old driveway chained off at the road with an old dilapidated sign that said private property. We parked on the road and walked in about a half mile and there was this old abandoned lock cabin house. I didn't know when it was built, but it was old enough to not have any connection to the electric grid and no electrical outlets inside. It was a bit odd, but my boyfriend said he had been there before and led me to a door in the back where we could break in. He mentioned that the last property owner said in their will that no changes could be made to the property after they died like no agriculture or major renovations. So I guessed that's why the land was never resold since nobody could do anything with it. I don't remember if we entered through the second floor somehow or climbed upstairs. But I remember being on this loft that overlooked the interior of the house with no railing, definitely a 15 plus foot drop right at the edge of the loft. Maybe there weren't stairs inside at all or a ladder. It was back in the fall of 2011, when I was a freshman in college, so it's all a little bit fuzzy. I remember seeing an old wood stove made of iron downstairs and a countertop, but otherwise I think the place was pretty sparse and made entirely of wood. There was also no sink in the kitchen area and no bathroom, so no plumbing either. The loft we were on had literally thousands of dead flies all over the floor. It was both gross and creepy. I know they could have just gotten stuck in there over the years, but the sheer volume and number of them on every surface and not being decayed or turned to dust was just unnerving. My boyfriend for some reason decides this is a nice place to smoke weed. I didn't want to stay, but he laid a blanket over the flies and he sat and rolled a joint. 
I did take a few puffs, but started getting an uneasy feeling, so I stopped. I'm a regular smoker, but this was just a crazy situation. Then suddenly I realized that the sun was setting, and we were losing light fast. The house very quickly got this terrifying impending doom feeling, and I knew I needed to get the hell out of there. I expressed my concerns to my boyfriend multiple times, each time seeming more desperate to leave, but he wasn't worried and took his sweet ass time hand rolling himself a cigarette and taking all the unnecessary stuff out of his pockets, laying them out on the blanket and slowly putting them away. It was pissing me off that he wasn't taking me seriously, and I had such a sense of urgency to get out. I ended up getting out of the house and started hauling ass down that half mile long dirt driveway to get out and away. My boyfriend shuffled behind me, fumbling with things in his hand. He was practically a prepper and carried all sorts of things with him in his pockets, cargo pants, backpack, all the time, like flashlights, lighters, weed pipes, rolling paper, weed, rolling tobacco, and probably 20 other things he thought were useful. I got out of the woods when we were just losing that last light before the true darkness set in. Mind you, this country road has no street lights the whole way. He had flashlights, but I didn't feel like the flashlights meant safety. I felt like we were being watched and whatever it was was super negative. I don't know if I overreacted or my boyfriend was literally just doped up and clueless, but I never really trusted him after that. I don't know why the heck I let myself get into that situation. Needless to say, he's not in my life anymore. Here's one of my stories from when I lived off the grid in the forest of Western North Carolina. Some friends and I lived in these small shacks, essentially a shed with a loft that were very close together. Living in such primal enclosed conditions breeds a kind of deep trusting friendship that you can't get from living anywhere else. So naturally we did almost everything together. By our little semicircle of houses, there was a railroad track that if you followed it south would lead to a waterfall. This waterfall in particular is where everyone would go to get high. It was a normal night, humid sometime in early July, and a group of about six friends and I, Laura, Andy, Nick, and some of Andy's friends that I didn't know that well but recognized, decided to walk out to this waterfall in the dark. I was the only sober one in the group, so I felt a higher sense of responsibility for everyone, and was therefore on edge and hyper aware of our surroundings. Others would walk faster or slower, or stop altogether in the group, so it was natural and expected that we wouldn't be able to see everyone at the same time. Andy was in rare form though. When Laura had to stop to pee, he came out of the bushes and scared her, and then ran off ahead behind the rest of the group. This annoyed both me and Laura since it was such a clear invasion of privacy, and unnecessarily spooked in the already spooky night. Laura and I eventually got into where we could see Andy again but he was walking by himself and then slipped back into the bushes without even looking at us. Dismissing him as just being high, we kept moving forwards, still not back with the whole group yet, and we realized that Andy has followed him behind us, just far enough away that we can only see his silhouette. Finally, we catch up with the rest of the group and see that all of us are accounted for, even Andy. We asked him how he got ahead of us and beat us to the group when he had last been seen 15 yards behind us just a minute ago. Everyone was dead silent, and Laura and I realized that whoever scared her when she peed and followed us wasn't Andy or anyone from our group. We never did make it to that waterfall. This happened around August of this year. I'm not sure what we experienced, but whatever it was, it terrified us. So this was a hike up to Half Dome. We had a campground around 20 minutes drive away from the trailhead, 
and the group was composed of 18 year old me, my uncle, 32 year old male, and my uncle's friend D. There were two girls with us, but they aren't relevant to the story. My uncle and his friend are both Christian, so there were no substances consumed that could be used to induce feelings. We get to our campsite, set up the camp and go to sleep after reading. We were planning to wake up at four to start our hike by 4.30. I randomly awoke at 3.30, like completely widely awake and looked out my hammock. And I remember feeling this odd feeling as if I were woken up by something. And remember looking out at this moonlit scene and thinking to myself, it's just like a dream. I lay back in the hammock, but couldn't go to sleep and ended up waking up my uncle and friend around 3.50. My uncle asks, why are you walking around at night? And I say, I'm not doing that. He says he woke me up for some reason and could hear someone walking around, not like an animal, but a person. I say that it's quite weird and try and brush it off. We get to the trailhead around 4.30. And it's as everyone is unloading from their car that D says he needs to use the restroom, which there are a couple of before the trailhead. I walked behind him and saw the car falling behind me and waiting for my uncle who had forgotten something in his own car. The short straight road from the little parking lot runs directly into a T section with the road of the trailhead and the bathroom which runs directly across from the intersection throughout the little field. Do who have been there know what I'm talking about. We get to the intersection and wait for D to escape the bathroom. We wait 10 minutes before going in to check and he's not there. I go back to my uncle and tell him, that's weird. Maybe he went back to the car to get something he's missed. By 5.10, we're starting to worry. My uncle goes to check the car while I wait at the intersection to make sure we didn't miss him. And he went down the road from the trailhead. My uncle says he isn't there either. We decided maybe he went up to the trailhead without us for some reason and walked up 10 minutes and he wasn't there either. We're kind of baffled now because there are no other logical explanations for where he could have gone and waited at the intersection for over half an hour and checked at the car, bathroom and trailhead. And you weren't there, he says. I went to the bathroom. He then asks me where my uncle is and I say it was at the trailhead and he asks me again. Note that it's weird as he's asked me twice and as we're crossing the bridge to the trailhead, he sees a lights off in the riverbank and exclaims that yes, that must be him. And I just look at him and keep walking. I thought his behavior was very strange, like he wasn't thinking straight. We finally get to the hike and it goes by as normal, except that we seem to be keep losing things such as my uncle's small red flashlight, one of the girl's gloves, a water bottle, etc. And it was just like we'd simply forgotten about them and couldn't remember where we'd left them. On the way back, it got dark and we turned on our flashlights. And as we neared the end of the hike, after the two waterfalls, it began to seem as if we'd been walking for too long. My uncle also confirms this, asking me, doesn't it seem like it's taking way longer to get back? I say, yeah. And I was just thinking that we kept walking, but it still seems we aren't making any progress. I've been on that trail many times. And as I was walking, I couldn't help but spot how weird those events felt. After we got home, my aunt asks my uncle if we were camping and he says, how'd you know? As we didn't tell them that we were going since it was a very last minute decision. She says that he had an odd dream where she sees my uncle in a tent of a forest and someone is outside of his tent. She says she couldn't see who it was, but knew there was a presence there. She said she woke up around three and had the strong urge to pray for him and it worked. I don't know what you make of all of this, but I really would like your opinions. 
Some 20 odd years ago, I was reconnecting with a family member. Said family member lived way up in the hills of North Carolina and had given me directions to his house. I was driving my vehicle and my sister was in hers, following behind. We each had CB radios so we could communicate on the way. We're driving, and I took what I thought was the correct road, and the dirt road immediately climbed to a very steep incline. We slowly made our way up and around this road, and it comes out at a dead end. At the end was an old rundown house with a huge front porch. On the porch was a plethora of things such as an old ironing board leaning against a window, crates of soda pop bottles and a few feed bags. An older gentleman was sitting in a rocker and had a long rifle sitting across his lap. To his left was, I assume, his wife, and she had one of those old timey wash tubs at her feet and was washing clothes. Then there were several barefoot and no shirt kids running around. They had stopped when we pulled up at the house, and there were of course several hound dogs laying around. Every one of them just stopped and was staring at us. I slowly rolled down my window and said very politely, Excuse me, sir, I think we took a wrong turn. He slowly was rocking in his chair with both hands on his firearm and just said one word. Yep. I picked up the CB radio mic, told my sister, back up, back up now. And we backed all the way back down to the highway. One of the most surreal things I've ever experienced. It was almost like we drove back in time or something. I used to wander the old abandoned mines, cabins and grounds of Montana, areas people hadn't been in at least three decades. I knew every cabin too. I knew people who'd been there decades prior, when there were still crazy old gold panning loony types who'd never give up the hope to find big. I remember one story my father has with one of those people. My father and his brother were looking into this one area, and a shot went over their heads. My father and uncle froze and said they were just hiking. The old man said they were trying to steal, and my father said who his grandma was, who had lived in the mountains since the early 60s. The old man then stopped, said to thank their mother for feeding him, when he was starving one winter but that he wasn't taking visitors that day, and to get lost. About a decade ago, my father and I found the dilapidated cabin that the man was in by chance, wandering randomly through the woods. It was really hard to find, and we had just barely come across it. Everything the old man had was still there. The roof was partially caved in, pots and pans were still on the stove, like he had passed in there or nearby. There was no body though, just everything was there covered in decades of normal decay, frozen in time, tools and all. It was a museum, a hundred years in the past, but only my father and I knew how to visit it. The old man must have passed at least 30 years ago, since he was so old when my father saw him. That cabin was bulldozed to build millionaire cabins eight or so years ago, along with dozens of other secret museums of the gold rush past. I used to know every secret path of that woods for miles in every direction, to every secret cabin, game trail, and serene, natural rest stop. It is all now an empty cul-de-sac with no cabins, because the money stream ran dry. I think that is the scariest and saddest part, frankly. This was a few years ago. I was 11. Me and my other four friends went on a camping trip. Everyone was happy to be doing something different, but I wasn't. You see, when I was younger, I loved horror movies and videos, so I felt off. I then eased into them a bit, and realized that if anyone tried to rob us, or worse, me and our friends, we could fight them or something. While well, my friend's mum, Tom's mum, had booked us a small hut to stay in during the week, but at night we would sleep in our tents. It was 8pm when we left the hut, which was to the right of our campsite, and Tom's mum was a bit paranoid, so we did the typical songs and ate marshmallows, and at 
we were told it was time to sleep. I got a tent with Trent who was a good friend of mine and started saying funny things that made me laugh. Outside was completely silent and the only sound heard was Trent's laugh. I really wanted to go for a pee, but had watched enough horror movies that I held it in. I guess eventually I didn't want to go anymore. I turned my head around to see Trent with his eyes wide open. Dude, aren't you gonna sleep or something? It's like 11. That was the first time I felt off. Can't you hear the crunch of leaves? I stood there shaking. I didn't know what to do, pretend to be asleep and take my chances. I decided to take that option. And I told Trent, we'll charge them. I'll go first, you wake up the others. I got up and quickly unzipped the tent lid, ran out my tent screaming, tent behind me to find no one. Tom's mum, who slept in the hut came out running and she asked what the hell we were doing. And me and Trent told her what we'd heard. She said that was off because she heard footsteps in her room and hadn't slept for the last two hours. We heard a loud cry from a little girl like you hear in the movies. Everyone spun their head around and we heard whispers from every location. We turned to the two cars and ran towards them. Cody's mum had also volunteered for the whole trip as she came running out the hut. Before we explained, Tom's mum grabbed her and shoved her in one of the cars and told us to get in. But Ryan noticed one of the wheels had a puncture. It looked burnt and it was as if it had scratches. We hurried to Cody's mum's car and the other was fine and we climbed in and hurried off. The mums reported this to the police and all that they had to say is that it's very common in this area. Anyone with any advice, it would be greatly appreciated. I was backpacking through Pisgah National Forest in North Carolina with my dog, just the two of us, and we were exploring the woods around Little Lost Cove, open orienteering style, so we were not on an established trail. We'd been hiking through the day following a creek, and towards the evening I noticed my dog was acting abnormally. She was very much caught in the scent of something and wouldn't ease up. This continued for about two hours before we made camp. That night in camp, she remained on edge and stared off into the wood line. I went about camp business as usual. Then at around midnight, I got this prick like I was being watched intently. I let the feeling ride for a bit and kept tinkering with the fire. Then I heard the brush rustle. I got up from the fire and shone my flashlight in the hillside. A figure on all fours just managed to escape the beam all but the tail. It was a tail I knew that was not supposed to still exist in the Southern Appalachians. I cast my light across the hillside and this time caught its eyes. Two glowing yellow orbs just watching and waiting. At that point, I went into a fury, grabbed my tomahawk and charged up the hill after the beast, screaming curses all the while. The watcher ran off, but neither I or the dog slept that night. The following morning, we left camp at first light and began hiking up the mountain to the ridge line, which would lead us out. Atop the ridge line in the fresh mud were a series of tracks left by an animal that officially no longer exists in the eastern US. They were catamount tracks. They commonly go by cougars in the east, but we'd been stalked by mountain lions just the same. Those tracks ran across the ridge, revealing it had been watching us and stalking us throughout the previous day as we hiked through the creek bed below. They weren't bobcat trails, I know that. They were way too big, as were those eyes I saw. I truly believe that if my dog hadn't been there to give me red flags, I would have been mauled that night. And it remains one of my personal scariest experiences ever. In my little town, there's a twice the ice station. Basically, you can fill up water jugs and five gallons and get ice bags for cheaper than you can in the grocery store. I went out a few nights ago to get some water because who wants to be drinking tap water? My husband was home 
and because I'm kind of heavily pregnant, he insisted that he go instead. I wish he would have. It was 1am, dark for miles and in the middle of nowhere. As I exit my vehicle, I open the back seat up, get the gallon jugs and close the door. As soon as I do, a dark blue truck pulls up perpendicular to me, presumably so I couldn't get out if I decided to get back in my car. Alarm bells start going off, and the bells start screaming at me when the slide door opens and two quite large men step out. It's about 20 foot distance between them and me. So I do the first thing I think of. I pull out my phone and answer a phone call from my husband and answered with, Hey honey, yeah I'm almost home. As soon as they see me answer, one of the guys says, oh, and they both get back in their car and peel out the lot, tires squealing and all. I throw my unfilled jugs back into my car and lock all the doors a million times or more before I broke down to call him for real. I told him to write down the make and model of the car, colour, and that we'd go to the police station in the morning. About two days later, there was breaking news of a pregnant woman that went missing. She had been taken, as her father had sworn up and down that she wouldn't just leave. I know it was the men in the blue van, and I've told the police all I know. I don't know if they targeted me because I was a woman all alone in the middle of nowhere, but deep down, I think it was because I was pregnant, and I don't want to think about what would have happened to me or my baby. So for my birthday this year, my adoring boyfriend decides to rent us a little A-line cabin in the woods of the White Mountains. Originally, we had plans to stay Friday and Saturday night, but only ended up staying Friday, for reasons I will explain later. We get there Friday around 2 o'clock. We bring our things in and both of us get a weird vibe from the jump, but neither of us say anything to one another because we really wanted to have a good time. First things first, and my boyfriend starts to make a fire for the fireplace. He does so by taking a large knife and shaving pieces of wood off the logs for the kindling. The tip of the knife breaks and he says to me, this will be much harder to stab you with later tonight. I look at him like, what the hell is he saying to me? And why would he ever say that? We sit by the fire until the evening, barely saying anything to each other. The TV is right in front of a giant window with no curtains. We end the night by watching a movie in front of said scary window. We go upstairs to sleep and my boyfriend barricades us in our room. I ask him why, and he says he has a bad feeling. I wake up in the middle of the night, because I have to pee, but I'm too afraid to go alone. So I wake my boyfriend up and he accompanies me to the restroom. I text my best friend before I fall asleep, saying that I don't feel right in the house. We wake up, and I thank my boyfriend for coming with me to the restroom when I was scared last night and he informs me he took me to the bathroom after we did it. I assure him we never did, and he swears we did. Anyway, moving on, we wake up and drive through the White Mountains. We get home around one, and he says he's tired and goes upstairs to take a nap. During this time he's taking a nap, I have zero recollection of what I did during this time. He wakes up from the nap, and we both decide that we need to leave and something's not right. We pack all our stuff in five minutes and dipped quickly after. This happened about three to four years ago. I live in Utah and have been camping my whole life. When I was roughly 12, I was in the Boy Scouts and went on a lot of camping trips with my troop. Every year, my troop went on an overnight camping trip to a lake in the Uinta Mountains called Wall Lake, where we'd backpack in a mile or so and camp around said lake. When I was old enough to join Boy Scouts, my troop had already been the year before, where one of the boys 
claimed to have seen a naked man running around the woods. No one really took him seriously. But it became a running joke that we would see this so called naked man when we went to Wall Lake. The first year, it was pretty unremarkable until our hike back. When we were hiking back to our cars, we spotted the naked man about a 100 feet away in the woods. After that, none of us doubted the kid who reported seeing him the year before. The next year I was 13. We went again. And of course, we were all joking about the naked man. Again, nothing out of the ordinary happened until we were packing down our camps to get ready to go home. While we were taking down our tents, one of the boys yells, Hey, look, it's the naked man. He was pointing at the top of a nearby cliff. And sure enough, there he was, completely naked, except for a cloth wrapped around his face like a turban, and a satchel over his shoulder. We all just stood there for a while. And a few of the older boys were yelling questions. And the like. He stayed quiet for the whole thing. But eventually he pointed at us put his hand to his hips, and pushed down in a pull your pants down motion. At this point, we were thoroughly creeped out. And he vanished from the cliff top. We all packed down faster than we've ever packed down a camp before, and sped back to our cars. I've still gone on trips to War Lake since but I haven't seen any signs of the guy. He was apparently seen by enough people that he was reported in the news. At the time of these events, I wasn't too scared. But looking back, I have no idea what this guy wanted, or what he could have done. And that is what scares me about this whole thing. Red River Gorge is a beautiful and huge park filled with wildlife, rock climbing, waterfalls, dense forest, gorges and beautiful views. This is a place that feels truly isolated, disconnected from the rest of the world. One evening, in the fall, my boyfriend Duncan and I decided to go camping at the gorge. We found a campground that was as backwards as possible. Sites were spread far from each other. And our site was on the edge of a very steep drop off. We arrived at sunset and quickly got to setting up camp. By the time we were fully set up, the sun had set. And we began to make a fire. About 20 minutes into relaxing by the fire, we began to hear howling that didn't sound too far away. We were both freaked out by the realization there were wolves nearby. But we tried not to overreact and continued to sit by our fire. 10 minutes later, I started to hear a faint yelling about 15 feet away past the cliff edges. I told Duncan to be quiet and listen. And we both froze out of fear. A woman was screaming now. I couldn't make out any words at that point. But it was a deep guttural shriek, a noise that I had never heard a person make in real life. Then I heard it. She was screaming, someone help me please. Oh my god. I'm repeating this over and over, howling it at the top of her lungs. I was terrified. She could have been turned around in the dark and fallen off a cliff or attacked by an animal. At this point, we both sprinted to my car, frantically climbed inside and locked the doors. I tried to call for police, but there was no service. I threw the car in reverse and sped down the dirt road to find anyone that could help and the shrieks continued. I didn't make it far before coming across a group of three young men standing on the edge of the forest. I slowed down and cracked my window still hearing the woman begging for help and asked if they could hear that. How could they not? I told them I heard a woman crying for help in the forest. And two of them went sprinting into the darkness without questioning me any further. The other one just stood by my car with no idea of what was happening. While the two men were somewhere in the forest, I drove further down into the dirt road until I found a spot to turn around. When I came back, the screaming had stopped 
and the men were back by the side of the road. I slowed down and asked them where the woman was. And one of the men that had run into the woods answered, Don't worry, it's funny actually. It was just a little kid at a campsite further down the trail. He was having a nightmare. I just said okay and drove away as quickly as possible. We left the campsite and went straight home. Once out the woods, we called the local police station multiple times with no answer. I know it wasn't a child. I've never heard such a primal fearful scream in my life. It makes my skin crawl and my heart race just thinking about it. What did those men get away with that night? And what was I a witness to? I searched the local news for weeks searching for something reporting details and what it could have been and came across nothing. I also think it's important to note that this happened in early November of last year, after the camping season was mostly over. We saw very few people there during our time. And I think it is assumed by most people that there won't be many people around this time of year.